introduction of you, uh, Dr. Kouridis, uh, is a assistant professor at the computer science department at the Rice University. Um, prior to that, he was a, a postdoc fellow at IBM uh, Watson Research Center, and he will uh, give us the talk remotely. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And uh, yeah, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I, it's really unfortunate that I cannot be here, but actually I'm, I'm in Eastern Europe right now. It would be a, really a stretch actually to fly back uh, to Vancouver. I mean, we just arrived from, from Houston. Um, so really unfortunate. I'm really sorry about this. I mean, I would like to, to be part of this uh, uh, very nice workshop. And I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Um, the topic of the workshop is about federated learning and vision. So the talk that I'm going to present is um, not more only about federated learning, but it's going to be in general distributed learning, the efforts that we have made the past three years at Rice University. Um, it's, a, it's an idea that it is main, mainly supported by NSF and Intel, but also like uh, partially supported by Amazon and Microsoft. And it's about... Uh, the general trend, to be honest, that I see and we all see recently where um, big models do not need to be trained all together with the old parameters being, let's say, updated, but potentially there are different ways of like maybe selecting some of the parameters to be fine tuned. And this is an idea before we go into now the idea of adapters and prompt tuning now in NLP, et cetera, et cetera. So, I just find it a very nice idea that maybe collectively we can think about how we can actually train these models. This is a joint work with several uh, co-workers, um, but mostly I would like to mention Chris Germain uh, from RICE, yes, that we joined with, uh, uh, thought about this idea. Okay, so it is about efficient distributed learning via the idea of like subnet training, and I will go through it right now. Before I start, actually, the only thing I want to say is that I cannot see you guys. So if there is any question, please come and talk, like speak up if you want, if there is a micro, uh, microphone and I, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Okay. Um, so what is the idea? And I will start directly. Um, what is the idea of the, initially we called it independent subnet training, but actually it is generally subnet training. And uh, I will tell you the story, like how we thought of it, like from the very beginning, how the idea evolved and what we have been recently working on. Um, so the original idea started very simply. It doesn't have to do with anything with like a vision. It was kind of like, let's start with an MLP and see what we can do. So what you see on the left, uh, left hand side of this slide is a um, uh, bottom up representation of a multi-layer perceptron where you have the input layer, three hidden layers and the output where you can see things can be dense, like uh, MLPs and even now, they are a basic, let's say, component of neural network training. Even right now, we're even thinking whether the attention models are actually large MLPs, like, like the MLP mixer kind of like idea. So it is a basic and a very useful, let's say, model to start with. And you can see that it can be a dense, actually it is a dense operation, operator. Like it might be simple, but if these layers are super wide, then all these uh, edges represent weights. So it means that you have big matrices to worry about. Okay, so in a classical distributed setting or like federated learning, you would assume that this model is sent to every worker. They are locally updated and the same updated of size, let's say um, models are sent back, right? So it requires a lot of communication computation, communication back, and you repeat that. Uh, and this can be like a burden, right? So the subnet training is the idea of, can we actually create weaker versions of this model by keeping the input and the output layer fixed, meaning that we do not subsample the neurons, the features in the input and the output layer, but we subsample what is active root neurons in the intermediate layer. Okay, so what you see on the right hand side is three sub networks where with black dots, you see the active neurons 
that we pick to be active for each of these individual weak classifiers, let's call them like that. And you can see that now I don't have to worry about every edge. I just want to worry about the sparse set of the edges that are activated for each of these um, workers, right? So um, the original idea, and that's the, actually I keep using the same uh, image from the very beginning since 2019, where we started this kind of like idea, because I think it is very um, illustrative. Initially, we thought of this as the sets, the um, per layer, the black dots, they are independent for each of the subnetworks. So there is no overlap between the first, the second, and the third, let's say, um, uh, subnetwork. But later on, we dropped this kind of like idea. Okay. So um, by just saying that, I'm just saying like, given the original, let's say, network, I generated three subnetworks where three is a random number, like arbitrary number here, where the union of the neurons in the subnetworks makes back the original network. Uh, this is a small note here. Of course, the union of the parameters of the edges do not make back the original network, but I didn't tell you yet what is the algorithm here. Okay. So what I'm just representing here is like a neural network decomposition. It's not an algorithm, but I just tell you that a big network can always and also carefully be decomposed into smaller, weaker versions of the original network. And maybe by training these smaller versions in a distributed fashion, maybe this is more beneficial than setting them in, in some way, in, instead of setting the full model like back and forth in a distributed setting. Okay. So as I said before, this is not an algorithm. So the question is like, how can I use this decomposition in a classical scenario, like in a federated learning, where usually there is a parameter node, which is, let's say, big companies, it might be Facebook or Google, Microsoft, whatever, that they care about learning a bigger model. And you have a bunch of workers, let's say, uh, and for this kind of like a workshop, let's consider them as smaller, let's say, devices, which actually really uh, fulfill our needs here. Okay, so what the parameter node, like the, the centralized node sees is like an, a current version of the whole model, right? So they see the big model and what you would do actually in the independent subnet training is instead of sending the current model and copy that for every worker, you actually subselect and you select indices and you say, different indices are going to be sent to each of the worker so that each worker actually is agnostic of the full model at this point. They just see a smaller model to worry about, okay? And by the time they get the current model here, XT represents the current version of the model, but also they do not consider the full model. They only consider the corresponding indices, okay, assigned to each of the worker. They can do some, and like as we do in federated learning, a, a specific number of like local STD updates. Okay. And that's not the end of the algorithm because as I saw later on, if we just decompose that once and we leave, like we let these um, smaller networks to be trained fully, right? Then this is the idea of ensemble training. It's kind of like you have weaker classifiers that they are not communicating at all until you get at the very end that you're going to use them somehow in order to make a decision. So in our case, we just do a small number of local updates. And this is just one iteration. What, what I mean by that is like the updated models, the subnetworks are sent back to the parameter node so that we recreate the bigger model. And in the next iteration, randomly selected subnetworks are going to be created. What I'm trying to say here is that it's no, it's different from ensemble methods because per iteration with high probability, we're not going to see the same subnetworks created. It might be ca the case that in the next iteration, worker one might see neurons that they were actually updated in the previous global iteration from worker five. And somehow this helps setting information implicitly among the workers. Okay. So before I continue, I know it is very diffi difficult 
And because I'm remotely, if there are questions, I would like to answer them, given that right now it is a very basic model. So if there are any questions, I don't want to interrupt with your, let's say the way that you thought about it. If you think that I should take questions only at the very end, let me know. But if there are questions, I can answer them right now um, from the from the audience. Yeah, th there there is a question. Uh, can you please come to the podium? Yeah, thank you. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My question is: uh, so when you're saying that you're only providing it with sub subnets, there is the these workers they're not seeing even the embeddings or anything of that sort. Uh, whether there are any, what do you mean uh, to see any embeddings? So is the worker not seeing any full version or anything that's a vectorized version, any, anything at all? No, nothing. Like, like, yes, yes. So they just see a smaller version. It's not that we distill an information or we embed or we compress or whatever. They just see a smaller version of the big model. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. All right, I think we're good. Yeah, um, <laughs> Dr. Kurda, is it still there? Okay, thank you. There is an internet issue. Let's just wait maybe one or two minutes. Many sorries for that. I don't know why this happened, but let me actually continue yeah. from where I was. Sorry okay, for that. No problem. So, so um, let me actually. So what is the vision that we have as a group is like whether we can move away from the, it's not like a bad thing to do the regular training as stochastic gradient descent where you see the full model, but whether there are like approximate ways of doing training, okay? And this is not the first, like, we're not the first to think about approximate training, and I will actually try to connect with existing results. For example, there is this idea of scheming, where you have a big network, and at some point you make a decision where you say, you know what, I'm not going to see all the components, all the blocks of the neural network, but I'm going to drop some of them for some of the iterations to approximate the training, right? Uh, there might be cases where you actually you decide to do an early exit. Still, this is an approximate training because you make a decision not to see the full, let's say, stack of like layers that you have, but you actually say, stop here and exit because I'm happy with that. And recently, we have this kind of like ideas of uh, sparsely activated uh, MOEs, like mixture of experts, where there are some layers within a big network where you decide to split them and because there is like usually it is a very wide MLP in this particular case where um, you say that uh, part of it is going to be um, I'm going to create different experts out of it by splitting it and then I sparsely activate this. All these are kind of like ideas of approximate training and IST fits in this idea because I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that it is like... Uh, um, let's say a completely new idea and breakthrough, this IST, like independent subnet training, is nothing else but unstructured distributed dropout. The idea that I just described is dropout. I just say that for this iteration, I will decide which of the neurons are going to be active. And I'm going to do that in a distributed fashion many times. 
like for many workers in order for them to be updated like in parallel and be combined and you actually keep doing that. Okay. The question is like, can we actually, so what are the main questions if I want to say is that bef, instead of just saying this abstractly, can we actually focus on neural network architectures to see how we can actually tune and, 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 and make sure that these algorithms work per different architectures, whether this is useful for scenarios like federated learning and whether we can actually provide theory about this. Um, this also from a different perspective, instead of just algorithms, also connects with systems, like systems in a distributed training. It's not like a new idea since 2010, let's say, for neural network training. We have the ideas of data parallel and model parallel. For example, federated learning is mostly data parallel, where the full model is sent to more, usually to every worker, but they have their own local data. And that's kind of like the, the main idea. Uh, there are more recent approaches like model tensor parallelism, 3D parallelism, and we have notable implementation, but not in the federated learning scenario. Like we have the cases of Megatron, um, uh, Microsoft has the zero infinity at deep speed kind of like ideas where they're mostly used in scenarios like um, I have a large model and I would like to use a cluster of GPUs in order to train it. But in a federated learning scenario, you have to uh, figure out also like different ways to do that because now um, you have to consider that it's not like always like a GPU at the very end. It could be like um, a lighter, let's say, um, uh, um, uh, let's say a worker. So what is the our idea, if I want to compare it, is an end-to-end, -end, let's say, it's still model tensor 3D parallelism, but it is actually approximate. Because the main difference of ISD, the way we split the model, is that, for example, the Megatron is the idea that still splits the model. Right. But the idea is that we always reduce back. We always make sure that the iterations of this distributed training is always identical to a regular centralized SCD training. In our case, we have surrogate functions. And the only question here is like whether the path of this approximate training that we follow in a way follows or it is quite similar to a regular, uh, let's say, uh, gradient-based training um, without losing much and actually having gains in, in efficiency. Okay, so this led to a series of papers. Um, uh, it was a little bit difficult for us to convince at first the reviewers. The idea exists until like since 2019 at the end of that, beginning of 2020. We live in the machine learning, let's say, world, a lot of rejections. Uh, we managed to publish the first paper in the VLDB 2022, to be honest. But since then, I mean, that's the good thing. I mean, we managed actually to put IST on map and we, we, we could publish more papers on that. Okay, and I will tell you like what was the story initially, starting with the VLDB. So what I actually described to you right now was the case of the on the upper left corner, which is the VLDB, where we started with MLPs because we thought that this is the main bottleneck in distributed training. Like you might have convolutional layers, but if the, the at the very end you have, let's say, wide layers, it would be like the majority of the computation and communication that you're going to do. So we consider the case where, yes, you might consider computer vision ideas and applications, where you have a CNN at the very beginning, which is global and always shared with everybody. We don't know yet how to decompose a CNN, let's say, layer. But the MLP part, which is most of the uh, weights for the case that we considered, it is going to be split in an IST fashion in a distributed setting. And we tried that. I know it is not um, the best way represented because I don't want to focus too much like on the results. But if you focus on the left hand, on the right hand side of the four plots, what I want to say is that we tried initially with full ImageNet. By full ImageNet, I mean the 14 million, 21,000 classes situation, where by having like, four, uh, like uh, 21,000 classes at the very end, it means that there is at least one weight matrix that one of the dimension is 21,000. You cannot avoid that. This is the number of classes you have. So it is a very big, relatively for federated learning scenarios, let's say matrix, 
that in a regular case, you have to set it like as is to every worker. But we say, what if we actually split it, we make it smaller, and maybe we can gain something. And the results were, again, without getting into too much details here, we can get to the same performance or even better. I want to highlight that because that's a very interesting point in a faster way, both in communication, like flops, number of beats, but also wall clock time. So that was a very encouraging thing that when we focus on MLPs, IST makes a lot of sense. And to be honest, just to tell you, like two days ago, I was reading a paper about whether MLP mixers is the new, like it's all about MLPs. Like if you have enough computation, you can actually set up a big MLP and you're going to have like good enough, let's say, performance compared to even attention-based models, right? And it is even the case that you can increase the dimension of your model, but you can keep the sparsity, like the active neurons, as a small one. And this actually increases the accuracy of the models. Like in general, this is an open question that I'm very interested in. And I would be happy actually to discuss it, whether that's the reason why IST actually performs better than training the dense model, to be honest. Um, so that was the, the initial idea, and I don't want to be out of time. Um, and then we said that, okay, who cares about MLPs? Again, remember it, this is back into 2020, where um, someone would say, I also care about ResNets because I want to do convolutions. I like computer vision applications, uh, no federated learning yet, okay. Um, so we focused on ResNets, but then in ResNets, you have so many different blocks, uh, like components that you have to care about. It's like you have the convolutional layers. You might have like, let's say, pooling operations. You also have the MLP at some point. And then we said that, what if we do the same idea, but we apply it on the residual block? So residual ResNets is like the nice thing. is like you have the same block repeated many times, most of the network, and you have the skip connections. So we thought that maybe the IST could be applied in a stochastic depth kind of like situation where from a very, let's say, deep ResNet, let's say ResNet 1, I don't know, 101 or ResNet 200, I can create smaller ResNets by selecting the blocks, make them like smaller, let's say um, uh, less deep. I train them locally to every worker, this, let's say ResNet 50, to every worker before I actually go back and I recompile the ResNet 200 and I keep doing that. And it turns out that it works really well in a distributed fashion. Like we managed to really reduce, I'm not talking about even abstract, uh, let's like say numbers like flops and giga, uh, gigabits in terms of like computation and communication. We reduce the wall clock time. Like we managed to achieve close to let's say the actual linear, let's say um, speed up. So for four machines, we managed to have something close to 0 0.5. Um, given the small data sets we tried with eight machines, we managed to do like almost four times, like we couldn't go beyond that. I think that this is also the limitation of the data set and the model, uh, and the model size. But that was quite like encouraging if you compare it to the regular training, you can actually, get the same accuracy in much, let's say, less, less number of like um, actual lock, work lock time, let's say seconds, okay? And that was kind of like the next step going into more complicated results. There is this also like idea that I really like also proving things. So the question was like, what about theory? Uh, whether what we're doing is kind of like arbitrary and maybe it's kind of like pure luck. It turns out it is not. We managed to theoretically explain, starting with MLPs, why this works, whether there is a connection between the over-parameterization and the number of workers that you have in your system. So the main, so the answer here is like, if you really want to use, let's say 100, let's say workers, you cannot split the model as narrow as you want, because then you're going to end up with weak classifiers that, that do not make sense, like they do not help at all. So if you really want to use like a lot of workers, it means that also your model should be bigger enough so that the smaller subnetworks you create is not like they're meaningless. So there was this connect connection between all these things and that was very useful 
and published like a TMLR. And it, we managed actually to extend this to different, let's say, architectures. We have like proof and connection of all these things also for ResNets. And as we saw later on, we said that what about other architectures? We tried graph neural networks um, where we actually managed to say that this goes beyond, let's say, just regular, let's say, Euclidean space, let's say, data sets. Now you have graphs, you have the adjacency matrices. All these things actually work really well. To be honest, like GCN is nothing else but a, a variant of MLP also, um, to be honest. And the nice thing about it is was at least back then, through the IST, we managed to be the first to um, really consider super wide, ultra wide GCNs. Like what you see here in this bubble, this D is the width of the original GCN. Like we consider GCNs, graph convolution layers, with width of number of neurons being at the level of 32K. And we said that if you just call PyTorch, it will not run because it is out of memory in order to handle that. But we managed to say that if you care, you're careful about it, you can still run these models by splitting them into smaller subnetworks and then combining them back. And yeah, that's kind of like the main highlight of this kind of like um, uh, uh, idea. Okay, so also it is theoretically justified. I don't want to go into that. Um, but yeah, this is kind of like the first let's say, set of results we got on, on like IST. And we're really li like, I really like the, this idea because um, this slide is more like not to put necessarily a stamp here, but it's just to say that this is an idea that all, also other teams also liked. Um, uh, not necessarily, to be honest, citing us, but I saw that there are more papers and more ideas that they go towards, let's say, sparse-based, let's say, training. Uh, the only paper that I remember reading before our paper comes from Google, that comes from this 2018 paper, where the idea was like only just a paragraph in a paper where it was actually saying, if you have a big matrix of a neural network, just split it into smaller parts and then send these same smaller parts to every workers, the same thing to be trained and accumulated and you keep doing that. So it's it's different from what we're actually proposing. And now you see like, I know that it might be Nicholas like uh, Nicholas Klein on the uh, on the call. You, you have Fjord, uh, which is like a, an idea um, co-designed with Samsung that is like a, from Google, the, the partial variable training, um, uh, also federated dropout and federated pruning. And I keep, I want to keep this list as the actually grows larger um, about how, what we can actually do with um, sparse training in federated learning scenarios. Um, so it's not the end of the talk, but I just want to say what was the initial take home message is like IST could potentially be a slightly different distributed protocol because you split the model, you split the data if you want. Um, it's not the regular, let's say, dynamics training dynamics of, of gradient descent. You still do gradient descent, but on surrogate functions that potentially has impact in communication and computation and actually in work clock time, okay? And there is also theory to explain some of the design choices that we actually made, okay? So the question now that I want to kind of like go and start closing this talk is like, where do we go from here? And of course, this is a talk, this is a, sorry, this is a workshop about federated learning. And that was the original question that also, uh, because it was co, um, uh, um, uh, funded by Intel, Intel was really interested in what can we actually do in terms of like federated learning. And we start thinking about the IST in federated learning where the idea was like, um, operationally, nothing changes. The whole discussion is if I do the same decomposition, but now every worker has data coming from a different data distribution, would IST break down and do like really doesn't do not work or would it still work? And without having the results here, actually it is um, a paper that uh, it seems to be to get like ha have gotten like good uh, reviews is that we propose the idea of using pre-trained models in computer vision where, for example, think of like you have like um, uh, uh, a wide ResNet or something else as a pre-trained model 
and you just use like the, the embeddings at the very end. And in order to do, let's say, classification, you append an MLP at the very end of that. And we try to do that like in a federated learning. Assume that every worker, the only thing that has to do is to download, let's say, um, a pre-trained, uh, let's say, dense net or two of them. And then you concatenate the output features of the local data. And then you on, the only thing that you have to do in a federated learning is to train the, the MLP, right? And it turns out that really works really well. Like IST actually performs much better or at least on par, but way faster than federated averaging or whatever you name it. We tried several cases like Nova, uh, FedNova um, and uh, Moon that actually it's, it's the way to go because you have small devices and you don't want to train the big model on the, on the, on the small devices. So IST plus FL is something that we're really interested in. Um, we also got into the, the case where whether this decomposition of the models um, could also be something that could, could work with asynchrony. Um, Mike Rabat is one of the, of, of the speakers. Uh, they have a very nice um, work on, on like asynchrony. We like this idea and we actually ask the same question. Can we actually have IST where the models are not actually synchron in a synchronized fashion they're aggregated, but maybe every worker just sends the updated model before they get, like, let's say, a stale version of the previous model, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, we do not take care carefully privacy concerns, whether they, there is a secure aggregation. This is why, um, for example, the, the attempt by, fame, uh, by Facebook is much better than ours uh, in these aspects, but we saw that you can actually have a synchrony to accelerate training without losing much. So you can actually reduce the communication, workload time and computation by just having a synchrony with IST because it, it feels like hog wild, like the, this old version of like, how can I actually do a synchronous computation in, in classical convex optimization machine learning models. Um, there is also theory about this. Don't worry, I don't want to get into that. Um, and one of the last things I want to say is that through discussions with Mike Rabat, he always, I, I still remember that the first question that he, one of the first questions he made, um, why do you care about IST? You can actually use a lottery ticket hypothesis, meaning that you can pre-train a little bit, select the core model as a pruning, and then you can distribute this parsified version for the rest of training. And that was a very, um, let's say valid and cool idea actually, that we tried that we saw that maybe with IST, you can do end-to-end -end sparse training. So even the pre-training of the pruning methods could be done in a way that at no, at, at, um, there is no point in training that the full model is going to be trained altogether. So you do the pre-training in an IST fashion, you split the model into workers, et cetera, et cetera to get it to the point that you can actually now say, can I prune, have I got to an early bird ticket, let's say, uh, let's say situation where I can select a sparse version of the big model to keep doing the rest of the training? And the answer to that is yes, you can do that. IST, um, even if it is an approximate training dynamics, it really follows the regular training dynamics, which means that it does, it does not lose the tickets. You can still preserve them. And that's also like a very cool idea in a federated learning scenario. It could be the case that you don't have to train like for the whole, let's say, uh, uh, lifetime of the model, the full model um, all the time. You can actually do a little bit of pre-training sparsified with lottery ticket or pruning methods. And then you can keep doing the, the training with like uh, with smaller models. Okay. Um, also theoretically justified, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, ongoing work is like, okay, everybody talks about transformers or visual transformers in this scenario. Um, this is kind of like um, attention is not something that you can very easily split. We managed to do that, but now we go to the point and I'm, I'm also like um, uh, judging our own work where Everything is about adapters. Like nobody wants to retrain the whole model. It's a matter of like having a model like GPT where you actually uh, add a little pieces like uh, intermediate or at the 
the very end or even at the very beginning, which is the prompt tuning. And the question here is like, where does IST and all this sparse training can be actually applied and whether we can actually do stuff on that? So this is something that which is, I would like to thank everybody. I think that I'm actually on time. Um, and again, very sorry that I couldn't actually be here because I think that it is a, a very nice, a very nice workshop. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, any question? Okay. I, maybe I missed this part, but how do you exactly split the parameters between the, the nodes? Yes, um, I, obviously I skipped a lot of like um, details, but in most of the works that we actually did, and I, that's why I call it like unstructured dropout, is like randomly. We do not use any structure um, for the splitting. So if I have, for example, a, a layer which is like, I don't know, 4,000 neurons, and I have, um, let's say, 10 workers, I might choose to um, assign 400 neurons to every worker, randomly selected. Um, and again, the, the, the other thing I want to say is that I never mentioned that there can be overlaps. So originally, the idea was about independent subnet training, that there is no overlap. But it could be the case that you can have actually overlaps among the selected neurons between the, the, the workers. In that case, you just average the updated values and you're going to be fine. So ba basically the random is done on each node or is it done on the parameter server? It, it is done at the parameter server. And to be honest, um, I kept the parameter server because it is closer to a federated learning scenario where it is just usually one parameter server. Um, but um, in that scenario, the parameter server at every global synchronization will say, this is the way I split the model. But it could also be the case that you have a decentralized parameter server where every worker could also be parameter server. And in that case, it's a different scenario, but we also have like this, this situation implemented. Thank you. All right, please go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I was wondering regarding the initialization of the parameters before distribution. Uh, I'm not so sure about the overlap situation. So in your case, you're just, if I'm understanding correctly, you're initializing the weights and then distributing them to the workers, right? Yeah. OK. So. Um, in terms of initializing initialization, what kind of uh, uh, methodology are you using for the initialization? Just any kind of random it's, yeah. So, so if, if you're talking about what are the let's say the weights values is like what what you have in the previous iteration. Yeah. It's not that we run the, we we start from scratch, right? It's like um, whatever the previous iteration gives me this is going to be the value that I'm going to send for the selected, let's say, sub-networks that oh. I send to each worker. And even though that you might have some sort of understanding on how the network is oriented in terms of uh, decisions, you're still sending the values randomly to the workers or sending basically uh, splitting the network randomly to the workers. You're not sending it specifically depending on the classifications that we uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the thing is like there are open questions here that we can actually explore. That's a very good question that uh, I'm, I'm sure that there is a better way of splitting the model and making decisions, what kind of values and what would be the indices to send to each. That's kind of like the idea, for example, behind Fjord, where Fjord is a, it's a way that you actually, you decide um, there is like a, a specific decomposition, which is in a way hierarchical. Like uh, you, you, you have like a smaller model, but a bigger model that includes the smaller model, and you keep doing like that. Um, if I remember correctly, so there are ways to do it differently. We just thought that this would complicate also the theory behind. Like there is no way, or it is very difficult to have like something that it is not random. That at the same time you want to prove something about it. But definitely, that's a very interesting question that you actually make. Thank you so much. Okay, hey, um, any other? Okay. Is there, is there time? Yeah, yeah, we have time. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Tassos, it's Mike. Great talk. Hi, Mike. Um, 
great to see all these extensions for both, you know, all of the extensions that you're talking about on this slide. Um, I guess two questions, maybe the, the more urgent one, if you have time is, do you have guidelines in general for how to decide what fraction of the parameters of the network to send to each client, how to, how much you can partition things up and how, how does that impact the performance? So how do you think about like what relative fraction of all weights are going to go to a given client? So uh, that's a very good point. And uh, if I understand it correctly, it's like whether you can have an unbalanced, like can I send like a bigger model to a more powerful worker compared to a smaller model to a less powerful worker, right? Yeah. So, that, I'm, I'm, so yeah. That and also if I have a very big network and I'm sending, you know, say 1% of all the weights to a given client, is that much worse than if, you know, if I could, maybe I could send 25%. But yes, I think the heterogeneous question also where you send more to more, more weights to more powerful clients is also super relevant and interesting. Have you thought about so, those? So, I mean, I, I uh, regarding um, how small the model can be, like you said that whether I should send 1% or 25%, I wouldn't say that there is a guideline that I can go on paper and say that based on the theory, this is the... Um, sent a one percent in a on a for a, at a specific worker. Probably this should be such that this one percent does not lead to a very let's say small network because it's going to be meaningless. This is what I'm trying to say. Like there is no pure guideline, um, but it's kind of like do not overdo it and send a really really small sub model because probably it will hurt rather than help the whole process. Um, now regarding unbalanced. I think that we're discussing with my students, but I'm not sure whether we made any experiments on that, but that's a good point. That's a good point. I haven't thought about it. Thank you. All right, are there any other questions? Hi, uh, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so in, in health application, particularly, the federated learning works with differential privacy. And so my question is whether adding differential privacy or noise to the model, uh, would it affect, uh, you know, uh, in this setup? Excellent question. And I really like that. I was hoping that uh, uh, Mike is not going to ask more questions because it will be more work for me, but now you asked the right question. Uh, uh, so um, this is something that I'm very interested in without being expert in differential privacy. I'm still learning about this, but I have the feeling like because the way we split the model is a random way, whether the, this actually leads into um, um, privacy amplification because it introduces more randomness or whether it makes it worse. So back to your question, excellent question. We haven't tried differential privacy kind of like ideas. And I'm just curious, even from a theoretical point for a very simple model, whether the fact that you split the model makes the, like the privacy better or worse. I'm not sure whether the audience is more expert than me or anyone there. But I'm super interested about it, uh, this, and I'm already like in touch with people to discuss and see whether we can do something about it. I, I, I don't answer your question, but I'm just telling you that I acknowledge that this is a, not exactly an issue, but an interesting, let's say, open question. Yeah, yeah, I think maybe I can chime in a little bit. So I think that's a very interesting uh, question. Actually, we did some work uh, we using the parameter efficient fine tuning in the federal learning. So basically we have like say adapter, as you mentioned, like you append like MLP, right? The adapter is like a small network. So you don't have to tune the entire pre-trained network. You can just pay a small portion. So we actually did the privacy differential privacy part. And we found out that uh, with this kind of, because you do the uh, gradient perturbation, right? So, but you are not perturbate the entire network you only mm -hmm. perturbate the small portion of the network. So we found out that um, the degradation of the performance is not severe as compared to like the full, your full train or fine tune the entire model. So I think that's one, maybe the benefit 
of this kind of sub network or small portion of the network. You just tune. Very interesting. We have the federal learning. Yeah. Yeah. More than happy to discuss that more, Chen. Like, uh, yeah. yeah, we can take it offline, but that's a very valid question that, as I said, I remember reading Mike's work on like a synchronous, uh, like a federated learning. And one of the things that they care about is like secure aggregation and what you're going to do. And this is something that we kind of like skipped over just because we thought, we thought that maybe we can, let's try to do our own, let's say naive way. Um, but I skipped this kind of like vital things which are more like related in practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have a one, one more question. Uh, sure. Yeah, hi. So regarding the previous question about the splitting uh, the whole network between the workers, uh, is it like more important to put more work, more beneficial to put more bigger parts to to the to the workers, or is it some kind of a threshold when it's when it starts to be feasible to and beneficial? So like regarding very big networks, you can split them into very big amount of more workers and they will have yeah. a lot of work. And uh, given small network, you you, will, you wouldn't have so many so many nodes to split between them. And how how how, how was was like the, the threshold and trade off between the, those? V very interesting question. Um, so if if the model architecture uh, is let's let's call it like it's not that I make like uh, because I have a theory about this, but let's split this between MLP based scenarios and non MLP based scenarios. For example, for the case of ResNet, we saw that it is more difficult. Like there was also like often the case that you need to fine tune them, like to really tune the model to not have like a small 1% gap between the regular training and our method. So, so we're, we were losing by one or 2% if you don't tune it enough, which means that having bigger and bigger models probably goes closer to what a regular gradient descent will do. And probably it's more beneficial to do that. It's just like the trade-off. I, I have to send bigger models to the workers and they have to update bigger models locally. So it's going to be a trade-off, then it's going to be more time for that, but I'm going to close the gap. Now, if you go back to MLP though, and that's why I mentioned that, there is this trend and there is also like theoretically justified in cold, I don't remember exactly, where they say, if you have an MLP that it is actually dense, keep how many active uh, uh, parameters there are, but increase the size of the MLP. So you're going to have a sparse MLP. This sparse MLP, potentially can be better in terms of like tuning and, and, and like training and getting like good results compared to the dense version. So in that scenario, having like denser and denser, let's say MLP sent to the workers, I'm not sure whether there is like a, a, like a, a phase transition where you actually start not getting as good as IST. I know it is a little bit controversial what I say, but we actually saw that with by splitting the model, you can get the performance which is actually better than sending the full model to each of the workers. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm asking uh, answering the question fully, but that's kind of like what I know so far. Yeah, that's super, super cool. Thank you very much. So are there any questions for the online attendees? Okay, I if not, so. I, I want to yeah. ask you, uh, you know, final question or maybe a comment. So you have this IST in, is the unstructured pruning, right? Yeah. So have you considered like from the software hardware code design point of view, right? Because we know this unstructured pruning is when the network may not, you know, take the advantage of the hardware. So like a PGA, you know, if it's some edge device doing that. So what, have you tried structured pruning? Um, I, I, yeah, that's, that's something that we definitely, um, care about. For example, um, when we do IST on CNNs, it's structured pruning because we prune the whole filter altogether and it could be actually structured pruning. Um, for the case of the MLPs, we haven't tried any of these let's call it NVIDIA two over four, let's say ratio, how they call it like MN um, structured pruning. Um, 
just because it's not my expertise, not like I'm a systems guy who is going to really fine tune everything to the level of like um, exploit. But I, I understand that this is like an issue. The only good thing of our method would be definitely the fact that you actually send less for, for the case of federated learning, you send less kind of like information over the communication, let's say channel. And even if like computationally, um, you might end up doing like a training if you're not careful about like a, a over a sparse model, but still it is going to be the same amount of time. Commu communication wise is actually better. So I, I, I agree with your point. Uh, and we haven't done much work on that scenario, to be honest. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. So I think this is a very uh, great work for the IST. You have a, a landscape of the, you know, with this kind of foundation, you can keep building up uh, from dif uh, different aspects. Yeah, very looking forward to your latest update. Maybe you have the Intel uh, October uh, workshop. So yeah, very looking forward to it. All right. Thank you so much for your time. And yeah, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. All right. Take care. Okay, so I think we have our uh, next speaker online. Um, Dr. Lane, uh, are you able to hear me? Uh, can, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. So. So I think, um, yeah, I think we can uh, get started. Uh, so I will do a quick introduction. So Dr. Nicholas Lang is a full professor in the Department of Computer Science and Technology at the University of Cambridge, where he leads the Cambridge Machine Learning uh, sy uh, System Lab. So we are fortunate to have you give a keynote talk. So uh, if you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you. Sure, thank you very much for the um, kind invitation. Um, it's great to be here. Let me just start by um, sharing my um, slides. Uh, let's move into um, presenter mode of the slides. And okay, and then share it with Zoom, share screen. Does that look fine? Yeah, yeah, we can see the screen. Yeah, thank you. Oh, great. Okay. Um, yes. So, um, what I want to do today is um, share with you my my views about why we should be um, investigating federated learning, why it's so important to me, um, and I want to um, highlight some of the work we've been doing around the um, the framework called Flower, and then explain how my academic group has been doing some work building on top of Flower in some pretty important um, directions we feel. Um, and so let me, let me begin this talk by unpacking this uh, title. So the title is kind of deliberately provocative. It's saying uh, machine learning in the data center is the combination of these two things, uh, a dangerous dead end for uh, society and their academic um, pursuits. And so uh, it's, it's uh, worthwhile, I believe, to, um, define what I mean by machine learning and data centers. And so when I refer to this combination, I'm talking about this ecosystem that you see illustrated on the slide. And so this is the ecosystem that we largely most consumers today can't escape, whereby if you're using Google search, if you're using a smartphone, you're going to find um, hundreds of models. And in the case of Google search, an escapable, the sort of um, workflow of models um, when you do a search or do anything else. Even when you're using something like Netflix, you go home, relax, you can't uh, escape this ecosystem that's, that's evolved, whereby we have, of course, these giant neural networks that must therefore reside in um, large GPU-based data centers, which are also combined with this need to consume large amounts of static data. And that's what this ImageNet icon is showing you here. So it's this ecosystem here that I want to put forward that while it has provided us with a lot of you know, beneficial types of technology, things like Alexa wouldn't exist without um, this type of uh, ecosystem. Uh, I think looking back 10 years from now, we'll see a number of negative externalities um, that we really are going to be disappointed in that society ever kind of really engaged in. And so I think it's I really want to emphasize how bad I think this might be perceived in, in history. And so 
Um, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, back in the 60s, people said it was fine to smoke. Doctors even recommended, hey, smoking is fine. It's completely healthy. You saw adverts like this. And decades later, people realized that smoking was, you know, it, it had terrible negative effects to, um, to people who engaged in it. And so we basically wish we never uh, sort of promoted this type of technology, this type of activity. Um, it's not the first time though. Uh, another completely different domain, lead paint. There was a time when we painted um, the interior of uh, rooms uh, with lead paint. It was you know, sort of to be fine at the time. There was a technology that we were fine and happy enough to use it for a period of time. We realized the negative side effects of this and we pivoted away from it. And again, I'm using these in examples to kind of uh, put into context how bad I think history will judge the negative side effects of using machine learning when combined with the data center. Um, and then there's examples I know that we kind of have still in society today, things like uh, the impact on the environment, things like climate change are examples of activities that we have yet to get away from. And it's obvious that, that we, we need to do so fast. Um, and then while I guess climate change is a fairly extreme comparison, I think things like lead paint and smoking are, are, are analogs of um, machine learning data center. And so why am I so negative on this combination? Well, I think because um, there's a number of, of negative side effects, one of which is uh, user privacy control. And that's what federated learning attempts to kind of often be used to ameliorate um, but there's a large number of other ones that are almost, if not, uh, they're arguably just as bad, if not worse. And so one I want to highlight is um, the brittleness um, of the safety, uh, the brittleness of the systems that are built on this ecosystem. So if you're talking about robots, you're talking about smart devices like the smart stethoscope, if the intelligence of these systems reside in the cloud, if it's all data center based machine learning, um, it doesn't take much for these devices to become dumb again. And that's just a break or a slowdown in the connection with the, the host um, cloud system. So this is an untenable position for building technology of this kind. Um, another one would be, uh, it's well known now, the type of uh, carbon footprint, um, the type of centralized uh, level of control of, of, of data centers and the need of having all these GPUs that come with it. Um, something that I haven't heard focused on too much is that there's a very clear, in my mind, negative externality of using data centers and machine learning is the reliance on um, data sets that are, although initially you might think of them as being very large, like you can think of data sets such as ImageNet and the ones that have come afterwards and those that exist in other domains as being um, very large in comparison to the real world that they attempt to model they're actually very small. And it, it's, it's because of their sort of scale and lack of diversity in relation to the real world that I think that they can be pointed at as being one of the reasons why we have quite biased machine learning. So there's a variety of reasons why machine learning ends up being biased. But I think one straight line you can draw is that the, um, the small scale data sets that struggle even at their largest size to capture the diversity and the sort of the um, complexity of the real world leads to results that you see on the bottom right hand part of the slide here, whereby because the source data set does not adequately describe all the different types of faces that one might encounter, um, it's unable to model accurately large swaths of the population. And so that's one sort of less promoted uh, side effects of this type of learning. Um, highly related to this is that I think it's interesting just to think of the context of data that we're not using currently. And so this slide here is trying to highlight that even, even if you think of all the data that's being used to train a model such as ChatGPT, and uh, largely those models are based on web data, uh, based on data that's easily accessible on the internet, in fact, this data, which is commonly thought of as being large scale, is actually dwarfed by the data that's un currently unreachable. And so if you think about all the data that's locked away inside people's phones, that it's inaccessible, if you think about all the data that's locked inside 
um, various machines that exist within corporations, within nonprofits, within governments that are difficult, if not impossible to currently access, um, you can start to see that if we have alternative ways to touch this data, to connect with this data, to train on this data, we can start to have models that are much more representative of the real world and have far less of these biases. And this is the promise that I think that um, federated learning offers us. Uh, in a nutshell, I think all of these reasons push us towards thinking about all sorts of kinds of different types and forms of uh, decentralized machine learning. And although in the past, my group has focused on things like on-device ML, which is very inference specific. And although there might be other types of really sexy new types of machine learning paradigms, the knock on the, often these emerging paradigms is that their accuracy in relation to the conventional data center supervised um, larger models is that the accuracy gap is just too big. I think when you evaluate what alternatives we have, federated learning is this sort of beacon of hope that we can start to consider and they need to start to invest on and, and make more proliferated, make more mainstream as a way to move forward. What's, what's quite unusual about um, federated learning as a technology is that simultaneously, it is used today by um, billions of people. Um, if you just take, for example, the Android um, keyboard, if you take, uh, for example, um, Android's um, selection of a uh, recommendation of settings and the various other kinds of, of applications that do exist from big tech. Um, interestingly, this technology is again used by, by many, many people for some uh, you know, daily applications, but also simultaneously, if you think about it, none of the breakthroughs in machine learning in the last N years are actually driven by it. And so it is sort of divorced from the current evolution of machine learning. Um, ChatGPT, uh, AlphaZero, um, any of the models, any of the models you can think of and throw at me right now, uh, none of these were trained using federated learning principles. And so federated learning as, a, as, a, as an approach is completely separate from the evolution, the current evolution of, of ML. Um, it's being used uh, by many, many people, however, and so one could argue that it's currently in the sort of in the sort of sort of um, hybrid state, whether it's not it's not really being used in the mainstream to solve uh, you know the next steps of ML, um, but it's clearly being used in some places, although those places are relatively niche. And so the question we ask ourselves, the question that I really want the federated and uh, people using federated methods such as CVPR community to think about is how can we transition federated learning to becoming much more widely adopted. Um, when we asked ourselves these questions, um, we came up with a, a large number of hurdles as to what prevents federated methods from being much more widespread. Some of these would be very obvious to this audience. So one of these examples would be that most of the systems that you can um, think about that we see deployed uh, are heavily reliant on supervised labels. And so things like um, some of these email systems I just threw out there um, wouldn't be a good application of federated learning because they demand uh, many labels. Um, and labels are very hard to get from, for example, client devices or devices, uh, some of these isolated devices where data may reside, but it's impossible to access that data to label it. Um, another uh, challenge is that of course, because of, by virtue of the, the approach, uh, we don't have this uh, nice ability to handle um, IID uh, limitations and the IID in terms of how the data is organized. The data appears at these clients, it appears in these systems um, based on how it is generated. And so it's very difficult for us to kind of construct nice, well-behaved mini batches where the distributions of the data in those mini batches properly align with each other and are nice and consistent as we can do in uh, data center-based machine learning. And then um, finally, uh, a big reason why it's difficult to get it used in, um, in the mainstream is of the, the uh, heavy penalties in terms of system overhead, flow convergence, um, variations between the clients, um, the fact that the, basically the underlying hardware of these systems is, is not uh, 
it's carefully designed as data centers to, to really service the training process. And so for all of these reasons, um, federated learning still remains in niche application. And so we asked ourselves, what would be the important step for us to, to overcome these problems? And so what we decided to do about three years ago was create a, um, a framework called Flower, where um, our first thought, our core thought was to solve these issues, what we need to do is do two things. One, we need to expand the number of people engaged in this topic. We want to make it as easy for any machine learning person to investigate the, the interesting challenges that federated learning presents as easily as they do any other type of deep learning. And we were sort of, when we looked at the different frameworks and how complex they were to use and how difficult they were to extend, we felt that we were really looking at frameworks that were sort of limited in terms of the evolution and they were much more similar to the frameworks that existed in the world of just deep learning um, as deep learning was uh, still a niche activity. Um, and so we wanted to create a, a, a framework that was first and foremost easy and extensible for, for a wide function of people to, to use. And so by that token, injecting more um, energy and community into the effort. Um, the second thing that we were alarmed by was the lack of scale and realism within the evaluations and the difficulty in achieving those goals were for any of the scientists out there. And so um, Flower is a, is this uh, open source community driven effort. I'll be talking about the scientific things we've built on this framework in this forthcoming slides. But before we get there, I just wanted to highlight um, that it's now widely used There's over 35,000 um, downloads of this framework every month. And actually just about two weeks ago, we ran our developer summit for the framework. Um, and one, uh, we ran it inside uh, Cambridge. We had 500 um, people register. We had about hundred people on site. Um, and one thing I wanna highlight to this audience, I think it's really interesting, is that we are um, within this framework, we're going to launch over the summer period. So July, August and September, um, a program called Summer of Reproducibility. Uh, whereby we're going to um, offer up a hundred thousand US dollars in um, awards um, given out for contributions to building um, reproducible methods from papers on a common set of APIs so that anyone can use them inside the Flower framework without having to understand the internals. And so if you're developing a new exciting method and you want to compare it against uh, a variety of other methods that exist in the literature, you can come to one place, use one common set of APIs, not having to understand all the different uh, implementation details and quickly benchmark what you've done against these prior efforts in a very easy way. So over the summer, we want to get to 50 different baselines um, and we want to achieve this by incentivizing people to build out or, or port their efforts into these common set of APIs that we've announced. So this is launching in, in July 1st. Um, but just to go forward, I, I also want to mention that any, any work I'm discussing here with respect to the Flower Framework is really this big team effort. There are a number of the core contributors, but actually there are even more than this um, slide currently indicates um, of students, people working in industry, um, postdocs in my group and, and so on, um, who are um, building out um, different parts of the framework to make it easier for people to jump on into federated learning and sort of really start to innovate to solve those problems I was mentioning earlier. So this brings me, brings me to one of the core things we want to uh, help facilitate with this framework. Um, and I mentioned um, realism, but I wanna focus not on the realism side, but on the scalability aspect. Um, the figure that you're, sh uh, you're seeing here on the left-hand side is um, showing you a, a number of uh, concurrent clients um, on the y-axis, the number of um, total clients in the um, pool. Uh, um, and this is for the evaluation of uh, more than 100 papers doing federated learning work. Um, each of those blue dots are different papers. I um, indicated, for example, the Fed scale paper there with this red uh, dot. And one thing we realized here is that although the motivation for many of these systems is to have a large number of devices working together to generate these models in a federated manner, um, 
the very few of them were looking at um, the type of scale that one would imagine these systems to be deployed on. So they were building um, algorithms and then testing them under much smaller scale. And that is uh, largely a function of just how difficult it was to do experiments when you had a lot of different clients in the pool. Um, you know, so not just a hundred clients, not just a thousand clients, but you know, potentially you might have a million different clients in the total pool, and you might have a thousand of them being used every single round. Pulling off that type of experiment was just simply too hard. And that's one of the things that we really wanted to shift the needle on with Flower. And so this green uh, star that's being shown here is showing just a, one experiment that um, we did recently with Flower, where we're targeting um, a realistic number of um, desktop or, or server grade uh, GPUs. I think it was about four or six different types of uh, different um, four or six GPUs um, being used to run a simulation of a federation where we scaled it to, I think around 15 million um, clients um, where each training round involved a thousand of those clients at one time. And so this is really just like a preview of the result. I'll show you how we do that in a couple of slides time. But essentially the, the components I'll be talking about are enabling the Flower framework to um, virtualize the memory usage of the individual clients and then do a smart allocation of those clients as it's doing the simulation to provide um, this type of um, facility. And the, the Flower framework itself has a lot of different moving parts like any framework might, enabling you to do things like um, run clients on real devices, um, uh, develop on a small scale, do a simulation at a slightly larger scale, and then eventually deploy all within the same framework um, uh, some new federated application based on a, on a cool new technique that you happen to have invented in the lab. Um, now this, this uh, pair of results here are uh, the same, uh, basically telling the same story that the last figure showed, but in much more detail. Left-hand slide is showing you um, for uh, the, the Amazon book review data set uh, under different configurations, showing flowers able to robustly train at the scale of, of, of millions of, of clients. So this is important because um, for academics who want to investigate um, uh, the effects of their algorithm at the scale that one might see them be deployed in, in the real world, it's important for them to be able to easily test them under the scale that you might see big tech run their federations. And so this is a gap that was, um, was present for, for quite a while until um, frameworks like Flower were able to provide this facility. Um, but scale by itself is not enough. We also need to be able to have um, a good enough speed as we're doing these simulations to make it realistic for someone to um, investigate the design space of an algorithm, understand if it's behaving well um, and so on. And so this next slide here uh, that shows the figure on the right really speaks to the um, throughput of um, flower when doing such um, types of simulations. And so this is for um, three different classes of data set. Um, we have uh, three different modalities. You have uh, speech, you have image, you have um, text. Um, we are comparing um, a recipe that uh, we call pollen included with the flower framework. And then you can see that um, the wax is a number of clients um, per second that are being um, executed during the simulation of these three distinct experiments in comparison to FedScale and Flute. And the takeaway uh, message is that um, FedScale and Flute are being outperformed by this combination of pollen and flower um, by three to five X. Um, so this is you know, very important for people who want to explore the design space to start to crack some of those problems I mentioned before. So how do we do this? Um, I just want to sketch out um, two main um, components to this uh, solution. The first I alluded to before is called the virtual client engine. Um, if when you're running simulations of this large scale, one of the scarce resources that you have to sort of manage is that of GPU memory. And so again, remember that the, the problem space here is that I, I'm, a, I'm an academic, I'm running a research lab, I might have maybe four to eight uh, GPUs inside my HPC, and I want to use that resource to simulate a large-scale federated system. Now, um, if I do this naively, I'm going to very quickly run out of GPU space, uh, GPU memory on my GPUs, 
because if I have millions of, of clients, um, they're each going to have to have their own little piece of the data set and so forth. And so I'll quickly run out of memory. So what the virtual client engine does is um, carefully instantiate the memory required by clients um, as and when they're needed. And so when a client is not needed, it's um, taken off the, the memory allocation for the set of GPUs. Uh, there's much more to it than that, but that's the key idea. It's a nice uh, seamless way to manage the memory um, as uh, simulations are being run. And then when combined with Pollen, Pollen is the um, component of the, of the sort of the ecosystem that makes uh, smart resource allocations. And so we have the first part dealing with memory and um, smartly allocating memory of GPU memory. The second part, Pollen, is um, being driven by a, a model that can predict the execution time and other um, system requirements of each client um, that will be performed, uh, the, the training of each client within a simulation of a, of a, you know, a large simulation over millions of clients. And um, this prediction engine, uh, if accurate enough, is then um, able to do the scheduling of when different clients run intelligently. So you're maximizing the throughput of um, clients being, uh, being simulated irrespective of, uh, you're respecting the dependencies of, this, of the federated simulation, um, but you're allocating them um, to maximize throughput based on being able to estimate what are their resource requirements and then you're packing them into each GPU and executing them in the order by which you can maximize the throughput. And so um, this combination of um, the virtual client engine pollen does um, allocation of work to the HPC resources in a way that's um, well-tuned for the needs of a federated system but is yet extremely uh, different from the type of allocation strategies that you would have for regular large scale training. And this is why you can't just use um, some regular type of um, HPC large scale deep learning training and use that allocation algorithm and scheme across your HPC to run a scalable simulation of a federated system. And that's why you need this type of um, approaches. Um, so I wanted to just give you a sketch of, of what that system uh, is and how we allows us to scale up to large amounts of um, clients and how it also allows us to drive throughput that's very fast to let you to, to do realistic types of simulation to show you one important piece of the framework that we think is influential in allowing people to explore and innovate in these problem spaces. What I want to do now in transition to the remainder of this talk is examine three case studies. I go through them one by one relatively quickly to highlight how uh, my team um, and the academic group has um, used FLOW to do a, a different interesting um, types of FL um, research. And so I'm going to start here by talking about um, our investigation to doing uh, speech recognition under a completely federated system, uh, whereby we're not just talking about doing um, hot keyword recognition where you have a small vocabulary, but we want to train in a federated setting um, a full vocabulary, um, full-size uh, speech recognition model. And um, the reason I picked this work was that it required, and it probably the, the biggest part of this work was to develop um, an acoustic data set suitable for training an ASR system that actually had the real federated um, properties that one would encounter if you were truly doing federated uh, learning for such an ASR system uh, out in the wild. And so what we found was that there was a limited amounts of prior work um, for learning this task in a federated manner, but they all used a data set called Libri Speech, which was uh, and is kind of the canonical um, data set that you want to evaluate your ASR system, at least in being part of the sort of stack of data sets you would use. Um, the trouble is, is that Libri Speech is trained over um, a limited number of different speakers and they're all doing it under relatively clean acoustic conditions and under um, fairly homogeneous microphone hardware. And that is completely different to how um, you'll encounter um, the speech um, collected from a federated system where you'd have, a, um, in a federated system, you might have thousands of different providers of, of information of, of speech. There's obviously gonna be lots of diversity in how people speak. It'd be very common for them to be speaking in very different acoustic environments. Some rooms could be large and echoey, some could be small, some could have lots of background noise. And that is just the baseline of how federated data is going to look like. And Libri Speech completely look, 
um, different um, from that. So we constructed a data set we felt had these qualities. We based it initially by using Mozilla's Common Voice. We took the French data set and we massaged that until it um, came out with the kind of properties that I was discussing. For example, having very dynamic acoustic background. And that became the data set over which we wanted to examine training under federated systems. Um, I'll just, I'm just gonna sketch out the, uh, the, the sort of the recipe by which we arrived at an, uh, an ASR system that was able to converge. Initially, given the complexities of this type of data, the prior methods that we saw in the literature just simply wouldn't work. Um, they were unable to cope with data that was truly representative of how federated uh, learning would look like out in the wild. Um, and so initially we we're not able to train. Um, but by, by experimentally trying different approaches out, we um, settled upon this solution that uses um, fairly recent types of um, ASR architectures. So you can see we're using CTC loss with a sequence to sequence attention model. Um, we found that we had to uh, move away from a conventional um, fed average approach um, when we we're aggregating the, the, the model weights uh, to one that's based on the weighting strategy being driven by um, the word error rate. So we're, we're um, aggregating more heavily from those that have low word error rate in terms of the clients. And then finally, we found that we needed to have a, a warm-up model. So we need to initialize the, the weights of the model that was trained in a federated fashion using a, a small number of centralized label data as a way to get this to work. Um, and so in our results, we demonstrated that under, you know, fairly tough, um, but faithful federated systems, this solution would be um, viable, where we are training for around 4,000 different distinct speakers with a test set of around the same size. And that the warm up size that we needed to have this thing converge was on the order of about 100 speakers. Um, if I just move to this part of the uh, result and draw your attention to the right hand side, um, this data set is actually um, relatively challenging for um, speech recognition to, to, to be done. And so the types of word error rates that we observe are, are much higher than the ones you normally would see for other data sets like livery speech. We saw word error rates of around 20%. But what was important is that we found by um, adopting um, the latest methods in, in FL and also adopting the, the, um, the methods that we developed um, for this particular task, we were able to approach um, that word error rate that we see in a centralized version relatively closely, which we thought was a, um, a quite a successful uh, indication uh, of, of speech recognition being possible, even under challenging uh, federated conditions. The, uh, the second uh, case study I wanted to highlight is that of uh, um, an effort we undertook to uh, measure the carbon footprint of federated learning um, as an approach. And so um, many of you will be aware that centralized um, machine learning is, has now been recognized as uh, producing a lot of different um, um, levels of, of high carbon, depending on what you're training. And so this, this, uh, this figure here is taken from probably one of the earliest papers to really highlight this, um, this property. And so it was taken, um, it was based on training a, a, a fairly uh, SOTA NLP model, whereby if you used um, all the bells and whistles, if you used things like AutoML, if you used uh, all the different hyperparameter training that was sort of common to train this model, you ended up um, uh, burning as, and, and, and emitting um, as much carbon as five um, cars being driven for their entire lifetime in the US. So obviously it was untenable. People want to look how we could um, do better. And what we realized was that um, federated learning is still you know, in this transition period of, of, of awaiting to be adopted more heavily. Uh, this would uh, be a good time for people to start to measure, build models of, of estimating the carbon footprint of its current design so that we can inform how it's designed in the future to avoid a similar types of consequences um, for federated learning once, um, once it's really being pushed into the mainstream. And so I just skipped the, the next slide. I just wanted to highlight the, the kind of carbon footprinting method, the gap in the methodology that we had to fill. Uh, we, uh, it wasn't that hard to estimate 
data center types of carbon footprinting because those methods already existed. So you needed to kind of capture, for example, the types of computation with GPUs. There's this issue to do with having to cool a number of GPUs that were in close, close proximity. So you needed to model how much energy required for um, the cooling. You need to uh, capture um, things like data transfer and storage, but they do weren't as nearly a big a factor as things like cooling. In contrast, the parts of the model that were required to be able to capture federated learning style workloads need to be able to accommodate a much more heavier workload being done on CPUs, as that was the common sort of um, hardware you would encounter in a client. There's no need, of course, to cool because these are physically dislocated. There's no deliberate cooling going on, but data storage and transfer um, becomes you know, a, a really critical part of the model because it's very often the data will need to travel over wide area networks, cellular links, um, or large distances. And so storage, data transfer, um, costs in terms of their carbon footprint need to be adequately captured in the model. Um, other aspects included knowing that depending on where the components, these distributed components exist and, and are operating, depending where those things are located, um, uh, you'll have different ratios of converting energy usage into carbon. And so, you know, France, given its use of nuclear uh, power, has a good ratio in comparison to um, places like the UK in, in, in a relative comparison. Um, we have a, we have a um, quite extensive journal article looking at all the variations of federated learning um, under which circumstances you have different types of trade-offs. And what we're really trying to do is provide um, a methodology other people can follow to examine this issue, um, guide how one would uh, start to redesign certain parts of federated learning um, but also highlight when does it make sense to use federated versus centralized learning if you're motivated by um, the carbon footprint. I want to show you just one illustrative example. It's a cherry picked example to give you a, a sense of what we're able to do with this um, method. I um, mean, I've picked a fairly interesting one because this is one whereby um, federated learning um, has actually a lower carbon footprint than um, centralized learning. And so this is the training of a, of a ResNet 18. We're trying to um, increase the accuracy um, to a 60% level using Sapphire 10. And we're comparing a data center based learning when we have a V100, um, one V100 in a data center. Uh, there's a cooling ratio of 1.67. This means 67% um, of more energy that is spent on powering the, the, all the other components needs to also be spent just to do the cooling portion. And then in the federated learning side, we're using um, 50 different um, Jets and Xavier boards where they're being recruited um, with five clients per round. Um, and what's interesting here is that even though that the data center GPU is able to crank through the data much more fast, uh, the, uh, because we don't have to struggle with things like um, non iodinous convergence can happen much more quickly. But even though all of this tailwind exists, under this situation, FL is actually able to outperform it in terms of carbon footprinting. And the key issue, the key thing driving this is a figure of this kind. And so this figure doesn't correspond to this um, result, but the, but the pattern exists. And this pattern is that for certain situations in these smaller models with small amounts of data, even though convergence is longer, and so the um, the number of epochs to reach 60% is being shown here on the x-axis. And you can see that the blue line is federated learning, red line is data center. You can see that this one took eight epochs versus two uh, to, to train to the same level of accuracy. The, the gradient, the amount of emissions per epoch is much steeper for the data center. And so you can have these, these trade-offs occur whereby federated learning can outperform the data center. Um, interesting insight that one can build on. Um, and so now that we're able to measure it, our next steps here is to, to hope that one can start to redesign federated methods that are much more carbon friendly. Um, the last uh, case study I wanted to highlight for us to discuss at the end of this talk is a, a kind of a key next step, I believe, for federated learning. Um, it's really looking at how we can start to transition from um, using federated training largely to um, learn from labeled data, and instead looking at how we can learn from unlabeled data. Um, because for most application settings, uh, getting 
labels um, from the edge is far more difficult. And so we're studying here an interesting combination of technologies. We're studying self-supervised learning when combined with federated learning under the context of video understanding. And I think this is the first time that these three different um, components have been come and put together. This was um, published in a, in a uh, last year at EECV. And we designed a system called um, Fed VSSL. And so um, I'm not gonna give you the details of the construction of the system, but I, I wanna highlight a couple of things. That is uh, under SSL, uh, the first step you want to undertake is the training of an embedding, whereby you want to uh, train this embedding on a number of um, tasks where the label is able to be um, computed. And so you might look at um, determining if an image has been rotated. You might look at um, if an image has an occlusion or a variety of other relatively simple tasks whereby the label can be um, easily inferred. And then you wanna train the embedding um, to understand if, the, if the, for example, if the rotation is, is present or not. And then by doing this type of um, training, the embedding starts to learn a representation that is then useful for downstream tasks. And our system, we wanted to find a way of doing this pre-training and then downstream task uh, training that have minimized the um, communication overhead within the federated system and also was viable for um, low compute um, clients to participate. And so that resulted in us um, doing a series of pre-training tasks within the federated system. We have a particular type of weight aggregation um, and the way that the gradients are, are sent to minimize the overhead, but then the downstream task training happens in a centralized fashion. And so that's a reasonable assumption we felt um, because you could have uh, relatively small amounts of um, label data for a task like video clip retrieval or action recognition. You could collect these in a more controlled manner, and but then you could also start to benefit from um, very uh, rich data collected uh, from these federated um, edge uh, devices out there in the real world. Um, what we felt was pretty interesting is in the results of this approach. And so it's the first time, as I mentioned earlier, that we that someone has shown a system of this kind in operation. Um, we uh, benchmarked on the Kinetics uh, 400. Uh, we had, and now the, the results you see there, a um, hundred different clients, um, and each um, client had eight classes it was doing uh, in terms of the embedded embedding learning. Um, and what was uh, an important takeaway was that we also observed that not only was the system uh, practical in terms of its system overhead, um, but its accuracy actually was better than the centralized. Um, not only it, it was better, not only than the, the basic vanilla form of um, federated learning using federated averaging, but our methods were also better than centralized, which is something you don't often see in most of these tasks. Um, so it was, it was um, quite, a, quite an interesting result. And to analyze this, we looked at the type of um, manifold that was being trained, and we found that the um, federated one was much smoother, less peaky in terms of its optimization um, point, and so it was easier for the model to, to find it. So as a federated, it was acting like a bit of a regularizer. Um, and so those are the three case studies I wanted to show you. I'm gonna conclude by presenting a, and discussing um, a prediction. And so it's a prediction about where I think federated learning can get to in the near term. We can definitely speculate about federated learning on the long term, I could say, oh, we're gonna solve all of these problems and then paint a you know, very rich picture. But I think actually sometimes seeing where we might be able to get to in the short term can be um, hugely attractive um, because it can give us sort of um, some goals to try to hit and, and an understanding of how the world might look different um, if we can get there. And so I personally think in the long term, Federated learning is going to become the dominant way we train all models. Um, but the first place I think we're going to see it really start to shift the needle and people start to take notice would be in the space of IoT 
perception models. And so I think um, if things go well, if the current types of progress we're seeing in a variety of areas maintain, in three years time, I think we can start to see um, IoT perception systems as illustrated on the left-hand side, doing tasks such as um, baby monitoring, doing tasks such as um, uh, observing um, people who come to the door through a doorbell, um, operating using um, self uh, learning. So learning the embeddings and then perhaps either doing fine tuning for a task um, either within the network or perhaps uh, as a cloud as an additional step. Um, but having a system of this kind being able to uh, beat any alternative form of data center based model. And then I think that largely this is gonna be driven by the uh, improvements in both um, efficiency and how we can perform the federated training and how this will blend with self-supervised learning. And what's gonna happen in this prediction is that there's going to be a number of um, unfair advantages for federated SSL that will mean that it starts to overwhelm the data center alternatives in a way that they can't keep up. And so one um, core aspect of this would be of course that data centers could also do SSL type learning, but the sheer avalanche of data that will be able to access uh, and not have to move from the edge to the data center uh, will start to become a, a huge drag on data center alternatives. Essentially, those data center alternatives will have to use less data than the FL ones because the FL-based um, systems will have already access without any cost to this data. Not only that, um, data center alternatives either will be trained with less data or with um, static data sets, you know, things like ImageNet++, but where the FL system is going to have a much smaller domain shift between its task and the source data. And then finally, uh, the FL system will naturally be able to cope with changes in the system in the, in the real world. Um, so as, for example, a, a doorbell system, recognizing people coming to the front door um, in different countries, you might have uh, the postman dressing differently and the system will be automatically able to adapt to this. Or if from uh, one month to the next, uh, uh, the color of a delivery uniform uh, or how people dress or how people sort of uh, behave may change from one month to the next and the system will automatically be able to make this um, adaptation without having to sort of really be radically trained because of the way that it's operating. And so these are the reasons why I think that this style of, of technique and, and model will be the first place that we start to see data centers being overwhelmed, but this will be sort of a canary in a coal mine because this will um, start to um, be the beginning of the end for data center dominance. And this will change um, a lot of things in how um, the machine learning ecosystem functions and operates. For example, it would start to diminish the importance of um, huge, ever-increasing um, data centers, at least for tasks of this kind. Um, and so there's, there's an inter-speech paper that, from last year, if you want to see us um, doing some of this projective analysis, although this was on the, on the domain of speech, um, uh, but we we're looking at this, this exact same sort of issue. Um, but I won't, um, I won't go into it. Essentially, it looks at the different um, challenges that one would have to overcome to make this viable. As I mentioned, I think it's realistic we could get there in three years from now, um, but there are a few moving parts that need to be addressed. Um, within this space. Um, so that's all I had time for today. I, I really want to um, provide time for us to have questions and discussion. Um, thank you for listening. And, and I also appreciate the uh, invitation to speak today. All right, uh, thank you, Dr. Lane for that. Okay, uh, any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so this flower framework, I'm curious how general it is. Um, for instance, I'm interested, and I'll actually be giving a talk in a 
uh, later this week, um, specifically for decentralized federated learning. Is this general enough that it could be applied to such a scenario? Uh, yes and no. So, I, I, so yes, in the sense that we have some uh, non, um, we have some we have some alternative ways of using Flower, some alternative APIs, and so on um, that are not part of the main branch right now that would facilitate this because we had a few requests of this kind. Um, so, if you if, feel free to ping me and I can sort of point these out to you and we can discuss this further. Um, but in the current main branch, because we were emphasizing on simplicity and allowing people to get um, up to speed um, very quickly, uh, the current design uh, doesn't support decentralized because initially it wasn't uh, sort of uh, required, but we're increasingly seeing this need um, moving forward. But I, I really encourage you to um, get hold of me because um, we're designing which we have a prototype design, but we're, we're kind of also improving it based on feedback from people like yourself who are playing in the space. Could, could I actually ask them, what's the use case for you? Um, so yeah, um, I guess I'm just more interested in the infrastructure as a whole. The place where I'm presenting is at this D-Web camp. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I guess I'm just uh, an enthusiast and I'd like to help build out this infrastructure for, um, I, I guess a lot of the reasons that you pointed out, just um, the privacy situation, uh, people owning their own compute, that sort of thing. Um, oh, yes. And Got you. so I, I guess that's that's my main motivation. And yeah, I'd like to see I'd like to see people's data stay with them and people be able to share knowledge. And um, I think that a big part of that is doing away with centralized servers. So a, a decentralized uh, method of doing this seems really important. And you know, if you have all the building blocks there, maybe um, maybe it's just uh, it's just a pull request away. Well, I think it's, it's a bit more of a change than that. But um, but we've been we've been working on it. But I think the it's always important to listen to how people are uh, what, what what are the APIs that they need and how they want how they actually assembling these things. Um, but I completely, I'm, I'm with you. I think the future of FL also is largely um, decentralized, uh, at least for many use cases that are kind of uh, motivated by those, you know, the core foundations of why we're trying to do this. Yeah, I, I think that you'll you'll certainly have nodes. I, I, I imagine sort of like a heterogeneous network where some nodes are trainers and some just do inference. Um, but yeah, I think um, uh, I think it'd be useful. Totally agree. All right, yeah, I'll probably connect with you afterwards. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, great. Um, are there any questions online? Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Yep. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I had another question about the Flower framework. Does it currently uh, support, or are there plans to support doing simulations involving other privacy enhancing technologies like differential privacy or secure aggregation? Yes, yes. So we have um, at the Flower Summit about two weeks ago, we announced um, the third version of our um, SA support. And so um, I guess the short answer is yes. Uh, the approach is that we have this modular design where we're trying to enable people to build the type of SA that they need that enables them to have the certain types of trade-offs that they really require for their application. Um, by allowing them to reuse as much of other people's things as they can, because we had noticed that the, the existing kind of um, approaches uh, were kind of a bit monolithic in the, in the way that they made, made you sort of engineer things. And alongside that, we are um, offering a um, kind of like a reference implementation that seems to be you know generically uh, useful for most people's applications, because there's quite a few um, trade-offs in terms of the, the um, uh, the quality of the model, how fast it converges, the overhead that in, in, in sort of an X, particularly on the server and so on. Um, so we kind of have a reference implementation um, where we've actually used different um, pieces of the literature. So, you know, we, we've actually sort of talked to a lot of different authors out there who've worked in the space to kind of build our first reference. Um, so the SA is a lot further along. Um, the other one, uh, DP is, is, is not really quite as mature we do have um, a design of the APIs that, again, with the thrust is to make it more modulus to let people build the type of DP support they, that fits their application um, well and enables them to play with the trade-offs. But we don't have a good um, 
but I guess that's still sort of more in flux. Um, it's still in version one. And then the reference sort of uh, implementation part of it um, hasn't been tested under a, a, you know, a lot of the different types of attacks out there. Um, but that's where the set of those two things are. Um, but we, we, we super it that we want to kind of move that forward as fast as we can. So if, if anyone wants to contribute, that'd be great. We're also looking for um, people to join the team to kind of also in a more stable manner to, to produce that too. Um, but yeah, that, that's where we are. Excellent, thank you. Okay, um, I, I do have one question. So yeah, I think this flower is a very good framework for the FL uh, community. So since we are, you know, I think here the vision conference, a lot of, you know, people are interested in benchmark in terms of vision data sets. So for mm -hmm. this flower framework, um, are there any, you know, already, you know, benchmarks has already been built so we can just quickly run it or maybe directly take the result like ImageNet or some other CFR 10, 100, some other data set and with different uh, FL uh, approaches? Yeah, I think there is, um, it's, uh, let's see, I, I, I've definitely seen examples uh, probably in the repo that have um, ImageNet, Safari 100, Safari 10, they're all there. Um, but I think the, uh, in terms of richness of different FL approaches, it's a bit lacking. Um, so I think there's probably three or four um, uh, aggregation strategies available. Um, but, but, one, but I mean, what I would say is that one of the thrusts of this um, reproducibility challenge, this uh, so we're calling it summer of re reproducibility, is to kind of build it up much more quickly. And so um, I think if anyone here is interested in contributing, they should um, in particular get hold of um, Javier. He's the guy in the middle here, or, you know, or myself, I can reject, re um, redirect you to him. Uh, we're happy to take comments and questions. We'll be producing in uh, probably by before July the 1st, a complete documentation of um, the competition so people can participate if they wanted to. And um, I think it'd be a great way to um, kind of a, a, a share with the community a, a solutions and maybe implementations that people already have and just normalizing the access to these things. Because one thing we found was that although you might have like a, a, a lot of different open source implementations, because of the idiosyncrasies of each one, they kind of demanded a lot from the authors. And so one of the kind of like core foundational aspects of this would be uh, the need to organize um, the code and the APIs in such a way that someone could just treat it like a black box. We can think we think that's the key. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it would be great. Like the neural architecture search community, they have a NAS benchmark, right? You see everything is there, all the benchmark is just in the wrong end. So I think you know, some of my students struggling is reproduce some of the results from the other authors' papers. So they took a lot of time to tune the hyperparameters, those things in oh, the yeah. FL system. So that's one yeah, big challenge for us. Yeah, but thank you. Uh, very, uh, you know, thanks a lot for the presentation. Yeah, I think anyone interested in the flower uh, framework will definitely reach out to you offline. Yeah, thanks again. Great, great. Thank you for the invitation and uh, thank you also for the questions. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, so I think uh, we can take a five minutes break, then uh, we'll be back uh, for the third uh, talk. Okay, all right, thank you.
do you prefer your video on or off? Do you prefer your do you prefer the video on or off? You want the video? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, maybe we can turn it on. But will that be taking the picture of the audience or? No, just you. Do you want? Do you want? Or I can turn it on. You don't mind. <laughs> okay. I think it's gonna be a big face. Uh. Okay. So we can. You have, you know what? We can just turn it off. Okay. Okay, so uh, we're gonna start our third speaker. Uh, Dr. Yang Liu is currently associate professor at Tsinghua University and also the Institute for AI in, of Industry Research. Uh, before joining uh, Tsinghua AIR, she was a principal researcher and a research lead in the AI department of WeBank China. So without further ado, I'll add Dr. Liu to give her talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, good morning, everyone. So today I'm going to talk about a new emerging FL paradigm, which I term it uh, knowledge transfer federal learning. Uh, wait, sorry. I need Just, to click this. Yes, I think you can. Why not? You can do this. Oh, okay. I see. Uh, so the outline of my talk uh, it concludes, uh, includes the following. Uh, first, I'm going to explain what I mean by knowledge transfer factors learning. And then I'm going to talk about uh, two popular knowledge, uh, knowledge transfer factor learning schemes, uh, namely KD based factors learning and uh, vertical factor learning, and introduce some of the uh, research highlights in uh, addressing the key challenges in these frameworks. So let me begin by uh, revisiting the various methodologies that we characterize better learning. Uh, for example, depending on the type of participants, uh, federal learning can be characterized into uh, cross-device and cross silos federal learning. Well, the concept of federal learning is first proposed by Google to allow millions of devices uh, to communicate model updates rather than raw data to train machine learning in a collaborative manner. It is later applied to a cross silos uh, problem across uh, to address the uh, data utilization problem across uh, enterprise and organizations. In the in cross silo setting, the number of clients are typically smaller, and the client reliability is assumed to be high due to stable connections. So the uh, red figure is actually a figure borrowed uh, from our uh, book that I co-authored with uh, Professor Qiang Yang uh, called uh, Federal Learning which is published in uh, 2019. Another way to characterize federal learning is by data partition across participants, uh, specifically if we project the users and uh, features in one figure, we can show that uh, there are different types uh, depending on their overlaps. If they have very a large overlap in features and different in samples, we call it horizontal factor learning, uh, just like the uh, data partition in databases. On the other hand, if they have a lot of overlapping in the feature uh, in the user domain, but they're different in features, we call it vertical factor learning. For example, a bank and a retailer company in the same city may have a large overlap in user base, and they can collaborate to build credit models uh, for local customers. And we observe that such uh, scenarios are very common in industry. Uh, notice there is yet another scenario where neither sample IDs or features have significant overlap, and for which we leverage transfer learning to improve the performance among parties. And this scenario is termed federative transfer learning. So in this talk, I'm uh, going to discuss a third way to characterize federal learning, which is by the type of information communicated among participants. Uh, traditionally, model parameters or gradients are communicated among the central server and participating clients. And we refer to such scenario as model transfer uh, federal learning. More recently, however, new federal learning paradigms have been proposed to transfer knowledge instead of model parameters in the training process of FL. 
And typical knowledge includes uh, sample logics or representations as commonly adopted in the concept of knowledge distillation. So one typical example of knowledge transfer federal learning is a knowledge distillation based federal learning, which leverage uh, knowledge distillation to transfer knowledge between clients and server. In addition, uh, we think vertical federal learning can also be regarded as knowledge transfer federal learning. Since in vertical federal learning, uh, both data and the local models are kept private and only intermediate results are, uh, from these local models are commun uh, communicated. And these intermediate outputs can either be logics or uh, sample representations. And so is federal transfer learning. And regardless of the various uh, federal learning schemes and their characterization, uh, the core challenges of any federal learning system are still the uh, privacy, accuracy, and efficiency. And to address the trilemma over uh, various heterogeneous scenarios. And privacy preserving technologies such as uh, MPC and the homomorphic encryption introduce efficiency bottlenecks, uh, whereas uh, different show privacy uh, suffer from accuracy loss. In addition, uh, compression and quantization are also actively investigated to improve communication efficiency without negatively over uh, impacting on the training, uh, training accuracy. So for uh, knowledge transfer federal learning, new advances and challenges for uh, addressing these pillar issues have also emerged. So in the following, uh, I'm gonna discuss addressing these challenges for two federal learning schemes, the KD-based federal learning and the vertical federal learning. And starting uh, with KD-based federal learning. So uh, the development of KD-based federal learn learning schemes stem from uh, several open challenges that we encounter with model transfer federal learning. Uh, first, it is well known that the deny the uh, distribution issue can cause uh, convergence problems and the generalization problems of a global model, which led uh, researchers to explore the root of personalization. Uh, which is to provide a more customized model for client. And secondly, because uh, FL plays computation burden on client devices, its capability is largely limited by the client resources, on which training a large model is often impossible. So we ask the question uh, if there's a way to break through such model capacity in a heterogeneous environment. And one feasible uh, approach is uh, to address these challenges is through knowledge distillation. In a, a typical knowledge uh, distillation based uh, FL approach, so clients and the server transfer knowledge through output, uh, output of a public uh, data set rather than private, knowledge, uh, private no models. So the private models actually kept local and the output knowledge of client models are aggregated to uh, on the server to train a server model, which then transfers knowledge back to client. But these uh, scenarios still suffer from uh, many issues. One of them is uh, uh, the improvement of uh, uh, knowledge uh, distillation based federal learning. Uh, our model, pre uh, model performance is quite limited. This is because uh, the heterogeneous knowledge and the central server uh, capacity of the central server model is limited. So to further improve the model uh, performance of the KD-based FL, uh, we first propose to uh, place a larger summer model. So let's put a large summer model on the original KD-based FL approach. And by doing so, we try to address the question if we can accumu accumulate knowledge at the server by learning uh, effectively from the fused class knowledge. In other words, uh, will a large server model be mutually beneficial to both the server and the client? And we achieve this by adding selective knowledge module uh, using label data. 
On the right hand side, we showcase uh, the performance of both the server and client models improves as the server uh, model become larger and deeper. And this phenomenon verified that placing a larger deeper server model helps boosting the performance of both uh, server and clients. But this is uh, based on using a large, uh, a large variety of labeled public data. So uh, this, uh, this scenario uh, de depends heavily on the availability of labeled public data set to enhance knowledge fusion. We then ask the question, you know, uh, if we can actually perform efficient knowledge transfer using a labeled uh, public data set, which is quite difficult since uh, uh, labeled ones are very hard to obtain in practice, but a labeled public data set has its uh, own challenges. Uh, for example, the uh, unlabeled uh, challenges with uh, Public uh, labeled public data set are uh, pretty uh, pretty obvious uh, because clients usually have diverse uh, expertise on different tasks. The knowledge quality from clients are both uh, limited and heterogeneous. And measuring these clients' knowledge quality uh, without using the ground truth can be very difficult. But to address these challenges, so we propose a framework uh, termed uh, FAT HKT. This is the hierarchical knowledge transfer framework. And this is a, a framework that combined uh, KD and uh, FAT model aggregation. Uh, so our main idea is that uh, since we don't have labeled data, then we can make a cluster of clients collaboratively learn a model to provide higher quality knowledge. Here, with the help of an edge server, uh, we cluster the clients with similar data distribution together. Therefore, we can enhance their uh, knowledge by collaboratively learn an uh, edge model, making the edge model uh, specialized in a subset of task. Then uh, each uh, edge model transfer the output knowledge uh, on the shared uh, public data set to the class server with knowledge distribution, making the server model a global expert. So finally, and the output uh, knowledge of the server model is transferred back uh, to the edge models and client models to uh, promote their task performance. And this is a hierarchical knowledge transfer uh, with the bottom layer as the uh, same as the model transfer fetish learning, which uses fed average as its basic algorithm. But on the top, we have a uh, KD based uh, fetish learning. So the combination actually gave a uh, pretty good uh, results. Here, uh, we compare the performance of FED HKT with uh, baselines in homogeneous and heterogeneous model settings. The results show that uh, the FED HKT achieves significant performance gains uh, for the server model, and, but also improves the personalization and the generalization performance of the client models. So this, uh, for this, we test the both the uh, personalized data as well as the global data so that we uh, try to understand the cli uh, client's personalized uh, uh, capability as well as its uh, generalization of its own model. And uh, we show that uh, over the uh, different tests, the results demonstrate that uh, FED HTKT actually enables uh, efficient knowledge transfer between server model and uh, heterogeneous client models. Uh, next, uh, we further uh, ex extend this knowledge transfer FL uh, scheme to the multi-model FL domain. Uh, multi-model FL domain is uh, less studied compared to the unimodal FL. However, uh, with the increasing amount of multi, uh, multimedia data on modern uh, mobile systems and IoT infrastructure, uh, infrastructure uh, harnessing this rich data without breaching uh, data uh, privacy becomes a critical issue. 
So uh, directly applying the KD-based uh, FL approach to multi-model data uh, is, uh, sounds like an attractive idea because it can address both models uh, with a unified uh, representation. However, this uh, strategy still faces a, a few critical challenges because uh, there are at least the two unprecedented uh, heterogeneous factors, the modality gap and the task gap. So if I'm a uni, a uni model client, then my uh, representations uh, learned from my uh, local uh, models are gonna be very different from uh, the uh, representations learned from another model, model uh, client. And uh, this representation gap uh, is called a modality gap. So uh, the previous largest transferred uh, FL frameworks are also limited to classification tasks because uh, in the uh, previous, uh, previ previous uh, frameworks, we typically transfer uh, the largest, which is the layer before uh, the prediction layer to uh, use that as knowledge, but uh, here uh, in multi-model do domain, there are many different tasks and uh, these tasks require uh, representations rather than uh, logic to be uh, communicated. So we need to redesign the uh, KD-based uh, uh, framework to uh, counterpart these issues. To overcome these challenges, so we propose uh, a framework which is called uh, Cream FL. Uh, CRIM FL is enable, uh, it can enable training uh, also larger uh, server models from clients and uh, with heterogeneous model architectures and the data modalities. And this is a dance through a representation and sample transfer on um, public data. And meanwhile, it can effectively address the model drift challenge using contrastive learning. So uh, we kind of uh, overcome the uh, model drift problem using a uh, different type of contrastive learning. Uh, specifically, we perform both the uh, intermodal contrastive and the intramodal uh, contrast, uh, contrast in client's local training. The intermodal contrast is to complement information from the absent modality uh, where the positive pairs are local representations and they are paired global representations uh, from another modality. And the negative pairs are uh, local representations and unpaired global representations. So the intramodality uh, contrast can enforce the unimodal image clients to head towards the shared uh, multimodal representation space to learn better uh, cross-modality interaction. In addition to that, we also design a global representation aggregation. Uh, this is to use the global local uh, cross-model contrastive uh, score for weighting purpose. So we assign a higher weight to the local representation that actually better matches its counterpart's uh, global representation and the less proximate other unpaired uh, global representation. We find the reweighting uh, using such strategy is very helpful uh, to uh, bridge the uh, uh, training gaps between different clamps. So uh, we perform evaluations of our uh, framework on uh, image text retrieval and VQA tasks and compared with the existing method, including uh, both the model transfer FL uh, uh, frameworks, such as federated, uh, Fed Average and Fed IoT. Fed IoT is another multi-model federated learning approach where uh, they use uh, Fed, aggregate, uh, Fed Average to aggregate model parameters by a modality, then they assign a different uh, weight to uh, multi-model uh, clients. And we also compare the other uh, knowledge transfer federal learning frameworks, uh, including uh, FedMD, uh, FedGems, and the showcase that the, uh, the CREAM FL uh, achieves noticeable performance improvement over all uh, baseline in all settings. So here we show that uh, we performed this, uh, 
the application uh, ablation studies on the three different contrastive module of our approach. And we show that uh, the performance continuously improve as we include each of the modules. Here, uh, the RAMFL is actually the cream FL with, without C, meaning that we use, we do not use any contrastive learning in this uh, uh, re representation learnings. So the uh, the federal learning scheme is actually just a vanilla representation ensemble using a KD based FL. And on the right hand side, uh, we compare the communication cost of our approach as opposed to model transfer federal learning approach. So since our uh, framework communicates sample level representations, we can observe that uh, the communication cost uh, grows as the number of public data or the dimension of representation. Each data point is the final model performance under the specific setting. And generally, we see that uh, Fed average and Fed IoT exhibit uh, inferior performance to Cream FL with higher communication cost at the same level of performance. So this is the visualization representation of randomly chosen images from Coco generated by a one multi-model client and a two different image client. The left figure is a benchmark a case without contrastive learning, where the aggregation is simple average. Uh, we observe that the model drift uh, ex exists between the two image clients and the model drift between the unimodel clients is much smaller, uh, is much smaller compared to the gap between the multi-model and the unimodel client. A uh, red figure shows the cream FL actually can pull the representations generated by different clients closer and effectively mitigate such drift. Okay, so before concluding this, uh, the KD based the federal learning section, I would like also like to discuss a little bit on the privacy issue of uh, KD FL frameworks. So we know that uh, model transfer federal learning are uh, vulnerable uh, to some extent to deep, uh, deep leakage attacks. And uh, I think the audience of this group may be very familiar with that already. So uh, there have been previous studies that explore the connections between model parameters, uh, gradients, and the raw data especially for computer vision test, where the pixels of image are correlated and can be reconstructed from the gradient values. So one advantage of a KD-based uh, federal learning uh, paradigm is that it does not transfer any model parameter. So it can eliminate the deep uh, leakage attacks. But uh, over the years, we have seen that uh, such deep leakage attacks proposed are getting stronger and stronger. So we asked the question then, uh, will there be a deep leakage from the lodges in the FedMD-like schemes? Uh, it's gonna be very challenging, but uh, we identified a certain uh, route that can may, uh, achieve this. So we identified at least the two necessary principles to attack uh, such FedMD scenario. Uh, in order for such attacks to be successful, uh, first, it needs to be gradient free, meaning that the attacker, uh, attacker cannot use any of the gradient related information because the uh, models are kept private. Uh, on the other hand, the attacker also needs to be a knowledge decoupling. By knowledge decoupling, what we mean is that uh, since uh, the KD-based FL transmit uh, the output or logics uh, from the public data set, if we apply a direct inversion to that, it will mostly give us the public data set rather than the private data set. So we need to design an attack that uh, only takes in the uh, public data set logics, but return to us the private data. This is uh, very challenging. And these principles make the attack uh, very hard, but none of the existing method actually can achieve uh, both principles. So we take on this challenge. 
And we uh, try to propose a new attack framework with uh, multiple steps. So first, uh, we train an inversion neural network model on public data and their logist, uh, just like the regular inversion model, except that uh, the input to the model is not only the predict logics from the client side model, but also the uh, output uh, logics from the server side model. Uh, remember, we have a server side model also uh, play in place in the KD based uh, fetch learning uh, paradigm. And I will, I will explain why uh, we try to use both logics. And then next, we try to estimate the output logics of server side and client side models on targeted uh, private data. Uh, so if we can estimate the output logics of the server side and the client side models, then we can feed this estimate logics to the inversion neural network model uh, to generate original private data. And finally, uh, to refine the estimation, we can also uh, use prior estimated from the uh, public data set for regularization of our optimization. This is tried to improve the uh, final image uh, reconstruction quality. And we turn our uh, method uh, paired largest inversion attack since it exploits the confidence gap between the logics of a server model and client model for the same input. So the inversion model we train has two terms. The first term is the no normal uh, inversion loss to recover the uh, raw data. And the second one is the regularization, which forced the reconstruction to be close to an estimated prior of the private image which are estimated separately from the public data. And the inversion model takes in two input, the logics of the public data and uh, the logics uh, from the server model and the client model. So uh, once the inversion model is trained, we then estimate the output logics of private data using the confidence gap optimization. This is the crucial, uh, crucial part of our stress uh, method. Because to accomplish this, uh, we first formulate the evaluation criteria for the quality of recovered image as Q. Uh, this formulation is based on the intuition uh, that both server model and client model should have high should have high logics for the recovered image. However, uh, since only the local model is trained on the private side, not the uh, server model, uh, then uh, we will anticipate that the server model will return a logic with high uh, entropy, uh, higher entropy than the uh, private the, uh, client, uh, client model. So we use the uh, above uh, criteria, which adds up these logics as well as the uh, entropy from the server side. And we try to optimize, uh, maximize this Q. And uh, based on this formulation, we can actually derive the analytical solution for uh, the, uh, for the uh, optimal logics that can ma maximize Q. So as for the prior estimation, <clears throat> uh, since the server can also access the public data, uh, it is able to obtain uh, prior data by transforming this public data. Uh, there are at least two ways in the, uh, for estimating these uh, priors. Uh, first, for unlabeled public data, we can estimate the prior using the average of public data. If auxiliary insensitive data of the same label as the public data set are available, the server can also use scan to convert the insensitive data to obtain prior data uh, for each target label. And finally, we use this uh, framework and we test it on different data set. Here uh, we uh, showcase uh, three different data set where the private data are uh, face uh, private faces and the public data are uh, uh, the younger for, for example uh, the first one is the younger version of a female and the second line is a master version of a person which actually uh, considered as a, a public domain uh, in our framework and the third case is a blurred 
uh, public data, which is less sensitive than the original uh, facial uh, face uh, images. So uh, our strategy try to use only the logics from the uh, uh, from the client and and the logics from the server model to reconstruct uh, private images. And as you can see, that uh, uh, T represent the number of communications in federal learning uh, uh, in our approach. And the uh, uh, the uh, our approach uh, termed uh, P L I. Uh, paired largest inversion uh, can recover the private data uh, as more communications uh, grows. And uh, however, uh, uh, the counterpart, which is a baseline attack uh, called TBI, TBI is the framework which is a direct uh, logic inversion model. It uh, inverts um, logic back to its uh, original data uh, using an uh, inversion model. And we can see that TBI can reconstruct uh, mostly uh, public data. So this is a, a showcase that uh, the performance of uh, our uh, uh, PLI uh, attack. And uh, this work actually highlights uh, the needs for the design and the development of more uh, secure knowledge transfer federal learning algorithm. Uh, of course, and uh, we our work has many limitations. And one of the limitations is that uh, currently it only applies uh, to facial recognition tasks. And we also have a poster at this conference uh, Wednesday. So uh, please check out our poster if you find our work interesting. Okay. So finally, I'm gonna uh, spend the, uh, the rest of my uh, talk uh, to uh, discuss a little bit about a uh, vertical federal learning, which also transfers knowledge rather than model parameters in their schemes. The vertical federal learning problem uh, is to find optimal uh, model parameters that minimize the collaborative loss under the following assumptions and the constraints. Uh, first, uh, features of the same sample are distributed across multiple parties, and the samples are assumed to be aligned or aligned by uh, encrypted entity alignment techniques. Uh, thirdly, and each party owns a part of a complete model. Only one party has the label, uh, which we term it active party. And the, those parties who do not have labels are termed passive parties passive parties. Uh, this is in line with many industrial applications. Since the labels are very precious and it only be uh, contained uh, in one of the parties uh, in participating the VFL. So during training and inference, model parameters and data both stay local and what is communicated are just the model outputs. And this is a typical uh, uh, protocol to train uh, a VFL. It contains two, uh, two uh, steps. The first is the entity alignment process. And the second is the privacy preserving uh, training process. So the entity alignment process typically use PSI, private, uh, private sec intersection, to uh, find the common sample IDs without reviewing any uh, unaligned data set. But after finding the common samples, uh, then each party can start training the VFL model using the aligned samples. Specifically, each party uh, compute its local model output on the minted batch of samples and send the outputs to ac active party, which then aggregates and computes the training loss. Then uh, the active party computes the gradients and trans transmits them back. Finally, uh, each party will com uh, com compute the gradients of its local model and updates their local model accordingly. So in VFL, we can decompose the model into a local model uh, termed G here, and also a global module termed F here, which is only accessible by the active party. 
And the, the global module can be either trainable or non-trainable. If a trainable global module is in place, uh, this VFL scenario is coincident with the vertical split N, if uh, many, uh, many audits may be familiar with split N, where the whole model is split into different parties that we term it a split VFL. If the global module is non-trainable, it serves as an aggregation function uh, that aggregates, aggregates parties' uh, intermediate results, similar as uh, Fed averaging. Then we term this scenario aggregate VFL. Another variant of VFL is that when the active party has no features and thus it provides no local model, in this variant, the active party plays the role of a central uh, central server. So in VFL, the naive framework requires communication between clients at each iteration, as I just described. Uh, with encryption, this becomes a bottleneck uh, for e efficiency. And the, here we borrow the idea from Fed averaging, where multiple local updates can be performed uh, before each communication. We then asked if such multiple updates can also be performed in VFL. Uh, we leverage block coordinate gradient descent to achieve this goal. So for each local iteration, each party locally computes gradient based on its own data and steal the intermediate comp components from other parties in the most recent synchronization. And for each communication, instead of performing one round of uh, local updates, we perform Q round of uh, local updates to save communication rounds. And we term this approach Fed BCD. So we theoretically provide convergence guarantees for this algorithm and the uh, experimentally show that the compare with vanilla uh, FAT SGD, FAT BCD can save communication runs by up to 70%. Uh, other than that, we discussed also the uh, data protection protocols of VFL. So the VFL actually needs to deal with both transmitted intermediate results and internal intermediate results. Transmitted interme intermediate results is the, uh, those information that actually uh, communicated among parties. Internal intermediate results uh, uh, refer to information such as the internal local gradients. Uh, these may be the, the direct information from, uh, third, uh, from transforming these uh, uh, transmitted intermediate results. So based on what is protected and exposed uh, during VFL training and the in, uh, inferences, uh, we have, VFL protocols can be summarized into uh, different levels. Uh, here we characterize each levels with a different uh, protocol and a security. So uh, the basic protocol is to keep the private data and model local by transmit a plain text the intermediate results. But this can uh, result in leakage, as I just uh, uh, showed before. The largest the output, uh, if transmitted uh, plain text, can, use, can be used to, to explore it, uh, other uh, data, private data. So then we uh, can further protect the intermediate results to uh, use a standard protocol, uh, which further protects the transmitted intermediate results. And the enhanced protocol uh, protects the entire training protocol, including both the internal intermediate results. So even the internal uh, uh, results such as the local gradients are protected. This is usually not protected in horizontal fortified learning. And the strict protocol uh, protects not only the training protocol, but also the local models from being exposed to its own party. So even after we train the local models, we still don't get access to that model because that model is a property that actually obtained from training collaboratively with other parties. So that model uh, uh, in potentially can contain uh, information from other data and a, a strict protocol actually uh, protected this information as well.
But actually, in literature, we observe that there are many uh, assumptions that actually relax these protocols, uh, resulting in a, a relaxed protocol, which uh, assume that either label or models are non-private. So various kinds of attack have been proposed under these above protocols, such as uh, data reconstruction attacks, which include both uh, label inference attacks and the feature reconstruction attacks, as well as backdoor attacks, which includes both the non-targeted backdoor attacks and the targeted backdoor attacks. So uh, similar to uh, the backdoor attacks to uh, general fed, uh, horizontal factor learning, the non-target backdoor attacks uh, uh, using missing features uh, uh, or noise uh, to generate backdoor samples and the targeted uh, backdoor attacks using uh, targeted, uh, uh, basically they use designed uh, triggers to uh, form a targeted attack. And uh, in, uh, in this slide, we summarize the existing attacks of, to VFL by their attack type, uh, VFL setting model structure. I am not gonna be uh, going deeply uh, through these attacks, but uh, one uh, take home message is that the DSA attacks that uh, uh, attempt to uh, target a lower security level. And uh, those who target a higher security level needs uh, require uh, sub substantial auxiliary uh, labeled information. So these attacks are, are still uh, uh, very challenging, especially for the feature reconstruction attacks. And this is a summary of the defense work that is currently uh, being developed by different groups over the world. And uh, we can see that uh, cryptographic defense strategies are still the mainstream for uh, provide secure computations. But uh, there are still also emerging defenses. Uh, these emerging defenses uh, explore different uh, strategies such as uh, mutual information regularization uh, and uh, uh, adding specific noise uh, so that they can target uh, at a specific uh, attack, uh, attack categories to uh, maintain a good utility. And the, the need for a VFL has uh, grown strongly in the industry in recent years. And then we show that, you know, there are many companies and institutions uh, owning small and frag, uh, fragmented data, constantly looking for uh, compensating data partners to collaborate uh, with uh, AI technology for maximizing their data utilization. So we showcase uh, there is a list of uh, open source uh, projects such as uh, VBank's uh, FIT, uh, uh, Pi Vertical, Fed Learner, uh, Fed Tree, these are all targeted at uh, VFL uh, scenarios. And the majority of uh, applications are still concentrated in advertising and finance. But uh, there's, there are still um, uh, major challenges in the advancement of VFL research. And we listed at least two here. So first, uh, uh, there is a substantial gap between the defense goal of uh, VFL research and practice. So we showcase that uh, there are many uh, VFL uh, defense work, uh, outstanding works uh, in the literature, but these objectives of uh, research works mostly focus on achieving a state-of-the-art performance on a targeted attack type, resulting in uh, uh, fragmented evaluations on separate tasks. But in reality, the practical development of VFL systems calls for a universally effective yet simple defense solutions to throughout all the possible attacks. So there is a notably uh, absent of a compress uh, compressive, comprehensive and fair evaluations that can uh, uh, encompass multiple attack and defense method under a, a wide variety of VFL settings. And the secondly, there is a lack uh, of lightweight unified VFL framework designed for rapid testing uh, new attack and defense algorithms. So to this end, we wanna uh, propose our uh, code base of VFLare 
which is currently still under development, but it includes a general pipeline to mimic the standardized uh, VFL training and the inference uh, flow, including uh, data model partition uh, communication strategies, as well as uh, extensive uh, attack and defense modules, which support a newly published attacks and defense method. So currently it supports uh, eight existing defense strategies, uh, 11 attacks, uh, nine models, uh, two partition uh, settings and two communication protocols and 10 data set. Um, it is still under development. A unique feature of VFLARE uh, is, is the effort to bridge the gap between the defense goal of VFL research and practice. Uh, specifically, we benchmark existing defense strategies on their performance depth and uh, breadth, where depth refers to their individual defense capability on each targeted task, and breadth refers to their comprehensive defense capability for all types of attacks. And to benchmark this uh, defense, we take both the model utility of the main tax and the attack uh, performance into our evaluation to develop a defense capability score, which depends on the weighted Euclidean, uh, Euclidean uh, distance to an ideal defense performance. And for the breadth of defense, we aggregate the, uh, the scores by type and further aggregate type level scores to obtain the overall compre uh, comprehensive defense capability scores. And uh, we will showcase evaluation results uh, soon in our uh, GitHub. And uh, if you are interested, please also check out the GitHub re repository for more uh, details for now. This is the work uh, done in our group group by uh, some of my, uh, my graduate students and intern students. So that's all I want to share with you today. And thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, so I wanted to ask about the uh, last slide that you had uh, with this uh, score. So it's dependent on a specific attack. Um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of trying to uh, have, let's say, privacy by design, uh, or provable privacy by design, rather than um, measure empirical privacy for a given form of attack, which may not be the most powerful one that's possible. Right. Um, so, I mean, how do you plan on... Uh, do, do you plan on having a specific family of attacks and you just kind of take the worst one or how is this score like well defined or will, will it be evolving over time? Uh, yes, yeah. yes, yes. And, and, and that's an excellent uh, question. So currently we are uh, in an effort to develop the scores which uh, comprehensively include all the um, heuristic, uh, you know, in practice the most uh, Worst attacks, for example, for uh, label inference attacks, this includes you know uh, many of the list above, and uh, these are currently uh, mostly uh, designed to do uh, experimental evaluations, and uh, so for some of them, uh, so. Uh, I think it, it is very uh, challenging to actually achieve, uh, you know, a theoretical proof for many of the attacks due to its exper experimental, uh, experiment, uh, experimental uh, nature. And uh, but I think uh, this is provides at least uh, the to the practical uh, deployment, the practitioners of VFL, what is the most effective uh, in practice. And that's the uh, goal of this uh, part of work. Okay. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. It's really good. So uh, my question is, uh, you mentioned the communication cost in one of the figure. So it's a little bit vague. In what perspective did you mean communication cost? Uh, which part? Uh, there's a figure if you go up. Yeah, yeah go up, go up. Yeah, up, up, up. So yeah, before... yeah one more, one more. Yeah, go up. Oh, yes, this, this one? one, yeah. Oh, okay. So, I see. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, I, I just don't understand what, what's up. And by the way, because you, you consider communication here, there's another aspect is uh, computation. So computation, communication, this could be the bottlenecks for the federated learning training. Right. So right. Uh, I want to know the motivation. So you, you pick a communication cost here. Does that mean like you really consider communication now is the bottleneck rather than the computation? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's two questions. Right, right. Thank you. Uh, so for the uh, for the communication uh, question, uh, this is to showcase the figure here is to showcase that uh, the KD based uh, federal learning schemes, uh, how the communication actually is compared with the model transfer federal learning. So to transfer models, it will also add a, a bunch of uh, communication overhead. And the, the a uh, unit here is actually the uh, uh, the base. So basically, how much information we communicate uh, to the server, and uh, this is what's the unit for the communication cost. The the communication cost. I think it should be the the total number of uh, information transfer in bits. But I I need to check with the like you can check the paper actually it should be the uh, total number of communication so the sorry the information uh yeah, it check. i mean i mean at least it needs to have a unit so it's a bytes or megabytes or something right it should be that's what i said uh, that should be a uh, base but uh we we uh i think that should be base yeah so uh, in the uh, it should be in the in the paper as well. So we uh, we will actually uh, double check it and get back to you. Okay. It should be bad. It's this is just a showcase the how much how much information is uh, communicated. Uh, because for example, the model uh, the larger the model gets, the communication also gets higher. And this uh, point is just to showcase to achieve the same amount of uh, model performance, uh, how much is uh, communicated uh, as compared to the uh, Fed average Fed LT and the, uh, the cream FL. Yeah. Sorry, I, I you, you, your other question is about the computation. Yeah, which ones which both have uh, this this work mainly uh, uh, addressed the commu uh, communication problem here. And uh, for computation, I think uh, because uh, here we are uh, comparing, you know, multi-model uh, federal learning uh, on different uh, scales. It, uh, the multi-model uh, com uh, computation. Uh, uh, I think there should be uh, right. So, so I, I sorry. So for for uh, for this part for this work, we didn't actually uh, address the uh, communication problem, and I cannot uh, actually give you a conclusion on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have your slides here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so our, okay, I didn't share the screen. Anyway. Okay, so our next speaker is Dr. Michael Rave. Uh, he is the founding member of the Facebook AI Research. Um, and before uh, joining Facebook, he was a professor at Magellan University. So uh, without further ado, let's welcome Dr. House. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks everybody for being here and thanks also for the invitation to present today. Um, so I'm going to take a slightly different approach today and rather than giving an overview of lots of different material, I'm probably going to focus for most of the talk on one specific paper called Where to Begin, uh, which talks about the importance of how we initialize when we're doing federated training and thinking about you know, how we can leverage pre-trained models uh, rather than random initializations and what are some of the, the consequences of doing this. Um, and towards the end of the talk, if there's time, I will also talk a bit about self-supervised pre-training, not directly tied to federated learning, but why I think it's important and maybe a useful alternative um, to other types of pre-training. So this is joint work for most of what I'll be speaking about today, joint work with my colleagues, John Yoyan, uh, John Wong, Shittiz Malik, and Mazir Sanjabi, uh, all of whom were also at Meta at the time when this work was done. Good. Okay, thank you. So to get us started, uh, and just to situate the discussion for the presentation today, let's just recall the Federated Opt or FedOpt, uh, Federated Optimization Framework of Ready et al. from a couple of years ago. Um, the focus of my talk today is going to be really on cross-device federated learning. And so in that setting, we have some clients, which are shown on the left, uh, devices, in this case, maybe mobile phones, and there's the server in the cloud. Um, conceptually one server, but often, you know, this would be much more involved, uh, but that's going to be coordinating the, the training. And to start things out, the server has some initial global model that's going to be used to begin the training. Um, the typical steps in this framework go roughly as follows, right? So the clients are going to indicate when they are ready to train, when they're ready to participate. Um, the server is going to perhaps use some client selection protocol to select a subset of the clients who will participate in the current round. It's going to send them the latest model, maybe also some additional meta information that could be useful uh, for training. Then the clients are going to perform some local updates. Those could be a fixed number of local steps, or more commonly in practice, we might tell each client to perform a local number of up, uh, epochs over the data that they have available. Um, and they're going to do that using some optimization routine, which generically would be called client opt. Um, there could be many choices for how that might work. As depicted in the bottom left here, you can see we have some initial model that we received from the server. We take a bunch of local steps. Uh, we look at the difference between where we ended up and where we began in that round, and that forms our model update. Once we're done training and once all of the clients are done training, and typically in order to preserve privacy, those will be aggregated using some secure aggregation protocol. So that what the server receives uh, at the end is some a weighted sum of these model differences from each client. Perhaps weighted um, could be different you know, model aggregation schemes that one might use, but for example, it could be based on the amount of data that the client has or the number, number of local steps that it took. Then the server is going to finally uh, perform some update to the global model that it's maintaining uh, using another method that's called server opt that gives us the new global model at the server and we begin the next round. Okay, so hopefully this is familiar to everybody, but this was just to get us all on the same page. Now, over the past couple of years since, you know, this concept of federated learning was coined, I guess back in 2016 or 2017, there's been plenty of research on lots of aspects in this figure. And in particular, um, you know, basically steps one through five have, have been studied very carefully from various different client selection schemes, various ways of performing local updates on devices, um, perhaps incorporating additional information from the server in order to reduce client drift, different ways of aggregating, different ways of performing updates at the server as well. Um, incorporating things like quantization or other forms of compression to reduce the communication overhead between the server and the client, and so on and so forth. And in this work, we actually kind of wanted to look at a different part, which we felt hadn't received as much attention, which was this initial step zero. How do we initialize the beginning of training? We know in general in optimization, how you initialize can make a big difference. Um, and so we wanted to see what were some of the consequences of how we initialize in the context of federated learning. Now, there's also several challenges that come up in federated learning. We've already heard from several of the other speakers uh, this morning, and I guess for this crowd, it might be also very familiar. One of the main challenges comes about due to various forms of heterogeneity. So there's data heterogeneity where the distribution of data at different clients might not be the same. Um, when this is the case, 
you know, we, when clients are taking local updates, this can be a source of drift. The models at different clients drift apart, and this essentially slows down our training. This is a well-known phenomenon. Of course, if we were doing this training in a centralized manner in a data center, all the data would be in one place. We could shuffle or permute the data, and that essentially renders this uh, heterogeneity problem, you know, no longer a problem. But in the context of federated learning, due to privacy reasons, we cannot do that permutation or shuffling, and so we have to deal with this. The other form of heterogeneity comes about due to system heterogeneity. Different clients are different physical devices with different capabilities, maybe different amounts of memory, different compute. Uh, and of course, tied into this also is this idea of data imbalance. Different clients hold different amounts of data, right? Typically, if we're thinking about uh, this data being generated in the context of some feature or an application on device, some users might use it much more than others, and so they're going to have more data. And so because they have these different capabilities or different amounts of data, if we're performing local updates based on, uh, or local epochs based on the amount of data that we have, this can lead to what was called the objective inconsistency problem uh, in a paper of Wang et al. in 2020, which then motivated them to introduce a method called FedNova, um, which we won't go into the details of, but I think is, is very interesting and a very important direction to consider. So we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, well, I guess on this slide, because there's been plenty of work trying to address various of these heterogeneity issues over the past several years. Uh, and again, these, these correspond to different ways to change steps one through five in the slide I had a couple of slides ago, whether it's changing the way that clients do their local updates, uh, the way that the server does its local update by, for example, incorporating momentum, uh, maybe in, incorporating some control variants, which involves transmitting additional information from the server to the clients or vice versa in order to reduce the drift, uh, changing the way that we aggregate to address the system's heterogeneity issue, and, and so on and so forth. And so all of these uh, all of these contributions modify aspects of the training algorithm or the dynamics. So as I mentioned at the outset, the, the, the question that we wanted to consider for the study I'm talking about today is how does the initialization impact federated training? And, and the main motivation actually was the observation that you know, in many practical applications of federated learning, at least in the cross-device setting, there might be some sort of proxy data that's available. So it might not be the data that we're actually going to do the federated training on because that's private and it's on users' devices, but maybe there's some other data that's somehow similar or related that we might hope to learn some useful initialization from. And so rather than initializing from random, which is often what we do or what we see in papers introducing new methods uh, in, the, in the academic community or in the, the scholarly community around federated learning, it might be possible for us to start from a different initialization. And of course, you know, there's certain things that we might expect to happen as a consequence of this, right? So we know in general in optimization, if you start maybe closer to the solution, you're gonna converge faster, not too surprising. So maybe we'll hope to see that too in the federated setting. Um, we know that for the most part, training deep neural networks is a non-convex optimization problem. One might hope that maybe starting from a pre-trained initialization also starts us maybe in a better basin or closer to a better, better basin of attraction so that the local minimizer that we converge to is of a better quality. Um, and one thing that we might not have expected, at least we didn't expect, but that is something that we're going to observe, so this is kind of a spoiler, is that it, it might actually turn out that by initializing, not in a random way, but from some sort of a pre-trained solution, we also no longer have to deal with the same kinds of issues related to heterogeneity, or at least it's not as pronounced of an issue. And so we're going to see that this comes up uh, in the study today. Now, I should say that there are there is some previous work that has looked into um, you know various aspects related related to this. So on one hand, we know outside of the federated learning world, um, transfer learning is widely used. People, especially when they want to address tasks for which there's a small amount of labeled data, uh, common practice for several years now has been to pre-train on some large, possibly related data set. Um, and then transfer your model, maybe uh, you know, reinitialize your classification head if it's for a classification task, for example, and go from there. Uh, same thing in natural language processing. We know that we do a lot of um, pre-training just for say an expert prediction task, and then we will fine tune some additional classifier head or some other sort of head on top of the model to address some other downstream tasks. And there's evidence in the literature that these fine tuning problems might be better behaved or better conditioned than when we start from a random initialization. So I shouldn't say 
than pre-training. It should be better better behaved when we start from a pre-trained initialization. Um, and the figure on the right is just one example. We have to kind of uh, be a little careful how, how much of a conclusion we draw from this, but this is looking at fine tuning uh, in the context of uh, vision classification models. And um, the observation here was that if you project down to two random dimensions, the, the contours around the area that you are fine tuning look pretty well behaved, fairly convex. Um, and this might be different than if you were to look at the overall problem that you're solving when you start from a random initialization. So this is outside of the world of federated learning, but maybe still gives us some inspiration or some hope. Uh, and in the context of federated training, there has also been some work that looked at starting from pre-trained initializations. There, the main motivation cited in these works and the main uh, focus of those works was to understand, can we bridge this gap between a centralized accuracy and the federated accuracy that we get? So it's well known that when we do federated training, um, by doing this on device with local updates, often the quality of the model, the resulting model that we train is not quite the same as if we had all the data available centrally and could train in the data center. Um, and often that's pegged due to being due to heterogeneity. Uh, and these works did show indeed that if you um, if you start from a pre-trained solution, that helps to bridge some of this gap. All right, so, so what are we going to look at in the study that I'm talking about today, or what did we look at? So, so we looked at experiments across um, a couple of different tasks, two involving image classification, others involving next word prediction for uh, language modeling. We looked at a couple of different models, and we're going to look at contrasting and comparing what happens when you start with a pre-trained initialization versus when you start from the typical random initialization that one would use for training these models. And in order to keep the setup simple and for it to hopefully be reproducible by others in the community, for our pre-trained initializations, we tried to use model checkpoints that were already out there in the public. And so for the image models, um, we're using SqueezeNet and ResNet 18, so relatively small models, um, which might be appropriate for federated training on device. The pre-trained initializations that we're gonna use for those are for models that were pre-trained on ImageNet. And those are directly available in the TorchVision library. Uh, and in the natural language case, we're using uh, also smallish language models, distill GPT-2 and a character-based language model, which I think is primarily LSTMs. Um, and you can see those are trained, pre-trained either on open web text or on Wikitext 103. Okay. Now the approach that we're gonna focus on in this paper is to start um, either use random initializations as I, as I mentioned, or to start with these models that have been pre-trained in the sort of standard supervised way. That's only one approach. There's definitely others that we could take, but for this initial study, we just wanted to start with something that seemed simple and, and ready to go. And when we transfer it to the federated learning task, we're gonna keep all of the pre-trained features, everything except for the penul penultimate layer um, to the values that they're at after this pre-training. And we'll randomly initialize the classification head We'll do this because often, uh, for the most part, the tasks that we're looking at in the federated setting don't have the same number of classes or the same size vocabulary as they did in the pre-training task. Okay. We're also going to consider a variety of different federated optimization strategies that fit into that FedOpt framework. So we have six different, or sorry, five different options for the client optimizer, uh, standard stochastic gradient descent updates, which would be like local SGD or Fed average, um, proximal updates, so like Fed prox, where the idea is to not drift too far away from the model that the server sent, normalized averaging, which is going to wait based on the number of updates being taken. Um, locally on that device. MIME light, which is uh, introducing control variates in order also to try to reduce drift. And as a fifth, for some of the experiments, we'll look at what happens if you just use uh, full batch gradient descent. We did this in the paper. I'm not sure if I'm gonna, maybe I'll mention it briefly in the, in the, the talk today. And on the server, we're also going to consider three different options. So one is the server also just does stochastic gradient descent updates, treating the aggregated model updates as a gradient. In all these cases, that's what's happening. And the second option would be like for Fed Average M, where we incorporate momentum at the server. And the third would be where we use Atom at the server, which would be akin to Fed Atom. Okay, so apart from changing these different uh, local update methods and the server update method, um, here's how we're going to try to 
set otherwise the controls for this ex these experiments. So we're going to have all methods run for the same number of rounds using the same local batch size on devices and using the same cohort size. So that part is kind of the same across all methods. Um, now, clearly these methods have some different hyperparameters and we're going to tune those. And in particular, we're going to tune the learning rate for each method, as well as some of the method specific hyperparameters. So for example, uh, in FedProx, there's this proximal penalty parameter. We'll also tune that for each workload and for each combination that we consider. So this is trying to give each method its best shot. And we're going to tune these separately for the random initialization and for the pre-trained initialization. Okay. So the main question that we wanted to get at then was how does this initialization, well, you could ask, does the initialization impact all federated learning algorithms equally or put differently, how does federated, how does the initialization that we use impact sort of our interpretation or, or our, the behavior of these different federated learning methods? And so here's the kind of result that we see. It looks like a mess. So let me parse through it um, and tr try to interpret what is up here. Because when you're comparing lots of different methods with lots of different things changing, it's, it, yeah. So here's what we have here. So for this particular figure, you can see that we have nine different specific algorithm instances that are being compared. Uh, three different versions of what's happening at the server, Fed Average, Fed Atom, Fed Average M, and then three different versions of what's happening locally on device, proximal updates, standard SGED updates, or MIME Lite updates. We consider two different initializations, pre-trained or random. And so for nine algorithms, two different initializations, we get 18 final accuracies. And so these are the 18 values that intersect all the way on the left and all the way on the right. On the left, it's for the pre-trained, where we start from a pre-trained initialization. On the right, it's when we start from a random initialization. Again, this is after the same number of rounds. What about all the stuff in the middle? The stuff in the middle is just interpolating between these two points. I don't want you to read into it basically at all, other than to observe that these lines cross a lot. They're spaghetti, right? And what does that tell us? That tells us that depending on which initialization we use, this changes the rank order of these algorithms and their performance and, and basically which one we might prefer. Okay, and I'm showing this to you for one of these tasks, but we see similar figures across all of the tasks. And actually there's one important point that I forgot to mention. Uh, so let me back up here. When I was looking here, one of the things I should have mentioned is, so on the left, we have the um, final accuracies for the pre-trained. On the right, we have for random. And you can see that the range is different also for these two different sides. In particular, when you start from a random initialization, the range of final accuracies that you reach after this number of rounds that we ran the experiments for is quite large relative to the, the size of the range that you have when you start from a pre-trained initialization. So already this tells you something which might not be too surprising, which is that if you start from a pre-trained initialization um, and you tune hyperparameters for each method, then the, the difference in performance amongst these different methods is not going to be as great than if you start from a random initialization. All right, so I was pointing out that we see these same conclusions across multiple different workloads, so different models and different data sets. Um, and so one of the things also which might be expected is that there's no single method that wins out in all cases. Um, this is often the case, but we did get the sense that for the most part, um, if you're gonna start from a pre-trained initialization, then using FedAtom is reasonably competitive across these different workloads and is a simple, Simple setup, so relatively few hyperparameters that need to be tuned. Okay. So what else? What else do we observe? So another question we can ask in this context is, what if there wasn't data heterogeneity? Um, so what if? So in this case, that basically means, what if we could shuffle the data across users, um, partition it across clients in that way? So we're still going to use local update methods, um, and. I guess this is what we observe now is, so we're looking at two different initializations, pre-trained or random. Uh, red corresponds to this ideal IID setting, right? We can't do this because of privacy, but we can ask the question, what would happen if we could? And what we see is, so it's been known in the randomized initialization setting for a while that there was quite a large gap between the performance, um, and this is consistent across several tasks, between when you, if you had non-IID data or data heterogeneity versus if you had IID data at the clients. 
And so we see that when we start from a pre-trained initialization, not only does the performance consistently go up as you might expect, but also this gap between the non-IID and the IID setting diminishes consistently as well. So, and this is specifically for Fed Adam that, that we ran these experiments. Um, so this suggests that when we're starting from pre-trained weights, then at least Fed Adam might be less sensitive to data heterogeneity than if we were to start from a random initialization. Another thing we looked at is the effect of the number of local epochs and found also this kind of surprising. Normally what we observe, uh, again, this is for Fed Adam. Normally what we observe is if we started from a random initialization, right? As you increase the number of local epochs being run on each client, you expect there to be more and more drift. And so performance degrades. And you see that roughly here. And for some reason, when you go to eight epochs, it jumps back up, but, um, but in general, it's decreasing. And it turns out when you start from a pre-trained initialization, you don't see this effect at all. And it's fairly consistent across. And so it's some, somehow it tells us that we're much less sensitive to how we tune that number of local steps or number of local updates, number of local epochs uh, hyperparameter, which is also maybe interesting and useful to know for practitioners. Okay, so we have many additional results in the paper, um, but and we have some various hypotheses for what might be happening. Um, but I think the one hypothesis that's worth worth really mentioning in the talk today, if we wanted to try to understand why does pre-training help federated optimization, um, the one that seems to be suggestive of the answer is that when you start from a pre-trained initialization, you start from a better condition loss landscape. So what we do here is we, we take the initialization and we look at the largest eigenvalue, largest Hessian eigenvalue, um, and we compare that when you start from pre-trained versus random initialization, and you can see that it's consistently lower for the pre-trained initialization. So this tells us that in the direction of largest curvature, that curvature is quite a bit smaller. Um, this suggests you know, that things are more well-behaved. I think there's still much additional work that needs to be done to understand this further. Um, but this was the most, uh, say, most conclusive um, of the various hypotheses that we explored for why might pre-training help in federated optimization. Without going into all of the details, let me just kind of quickly rattle off a few of the additional observations that we made in the paper, and I'll refer you to the paper if you want to see more, or we can talk about this afterwards. Um, so one not surprising thing is that the pre-trained initialization consistently achieves a better final accuracy. So at the end of training, it's consistently better, but perhaps surprisingly, at initialization, it is not always starting with the lower training loss. So there are, there are multiple examples where when you start from a pre-trained initialization, the initial loss is actually higher. And recall, this is, I mean, it seems maybe surprising at first, but recall that when we do this transfer, we still have to randomly initialize that final classification head on the model. So it's not like the whole model has been pre-trained. And so that kind of helps us explain why we might observe uh, higher loss in some cases for, for that pre-trained setting. One of the other things we observed is that local updates are not necessarily, not always necessary when you start from a pre-trained initialization. So if you were, instead of doing multiple local update, updates on each device, so that would be like Fed Atom uh, with local SGD updates. If you were just to have each device compute a, a gradient, just a full batch gradient without changing the model locally over its entire training data set and send that back to the server. So this is what we would call in the paper Fed Atom GD. So Fed Atom because the server is using Atom GD because the, the client is just computing a gradient. That was often competitive or essentially the same in performance uh, when you start from a pre-trained initialization as if you were to do local updates as well. So this is also kind of interesting. It's maybe surprising. Um, I didn't mention it on the slide, but related to this is that, you know, similar to the way that uh, data heterogeneity was not as pronounced when you start from a pre-trained initialization, it's also the case that systems heter heterogeneity does not have uh, as as bad of an effect when you start from a pre-trained initialization. So you can have clients running different numbers of local updates, um, and you don't see the same kinds of objective inconsistency. Maybe last point that I'll mention, but without going into detail, uh, keeping in mind that I'm standing between you and lunch, is that not all of our observations are readily explained by existing theory. So often the convergence theories that we have for local update methods 
do depend on the quality of the initialization through the local loss, through the uh, initial loss, sorry, the loss at, loss at initialization. Sometimes we observe that it's lower when you start from a pre-trained initialization, but like I mentioned, sometimes it's not. So this doesn't completely help us explain what's going on here. Um, and so I think there's maybe other interesting questions. I think it's probably difficult because this requires us really to understand better the loss landscape of training deep networks in general, which is not something that I think we have a great grasp on right now. But I think there's interesting work to be done there. Okay, and so for my remaining time, let me kind of switch gears and um, let me say the following. So this is kind of more of ongoing and future work. So, so all of the experiments that, that I told you about so far, we're starting from a supervised pre-trained setup. Looking forward, I think self-supervision uh, is going beyond supervised pre-training, I think is something that we need to do. And in particular, um, I think self-supervision is extremely important. And some of the previous speakers today have already mentioned this idea of self-supervision, but let me give my own kind of perspective and maybe um, uh, try to also point you to some additional work to go check out later this week. So, so why do I think self-supervision is, is kind of an interesting way to go? Well, we know um, young humans learn quite a bit about the world just from passive observation, okay? Not necessarily from receiving any sort of supervision. Um, and so these are some experiments that are shown on this slide from more of the cognitive science and psychology literature where there would be kind of a, so the, the setting goes as follows. So um, there's some new objects that probably nobody has seen before that are given names that are not very common, right? And in this experiment or a series of experiments, um, the first thing that would happen would be that a toddler and their parent would go into a room and start playing with some of these objects. And the parent was instructed to name the object with its creative name only one time during that, that episode when they're playing. Then the parent would leave the room and one of the administrators of this study would go in and they would talk to the, talk to the toddler, um, you know, ask them if they had fun and they would ask them, oh, by the way, sorry, I can't remember. Could you tell me which one of these is the Tema or which one of these is the Dodi? And with very high probability, the, the toddler was able to point to the correct example. Um, and so this tells us that, you know, there's certain characteristics that we learn without needing a lot of label data but we just learned by passive observation related to things like shape, color, and so on in the visual setting. Um, but we believe this is a much more general principle. And so um, there's been a lot of excitement around self-supervised learning over the past couple of years, but I would like to kind of talk about one approach that I'm very excited about in particular, which is called the image joint embedding predictive architecture. Um, and this, this approach works as follows. So we're gonna have an image uh, and we're going to think of breaking that image into patches. We're going to take a small subset of the patches and call those a context. And we're going to pass those through some encoder. This could be whatever your favorite backbone is. Let's say it's some vision transformer or ResNet to get some embedding of those patches. Um, we're also going to take a target. Uh, sorry, from the same image, we're going to take a number of targets um, shown by these different colored boxes here, which don't necessarily overlap with the context. And we're going to encode those and we're going to ask a predictor, given the encoding of the embeddings of the context and information about what is the region to predict, to predict what is the embedding or the, the you know, representation of those re regions, if it had seen that. And we're going to train it in order to make those predictions. So we're going to train both the encoder and the predictor simultaneously to do this. And it turns out this approach is very effective. I won't go into all the details again in the interest of time. Um, but one nice thing is that this approach does not require any handcrafted data augmentations. We're only using a sort of a, a form of masking here. Um, and one other nice property of these embeddings, which I think makes them useful in general, but also maybe in the context of federated learning, is that they work quite well when you consider downstream tasks where you have a very small amount of labeled data and you would like to transfer very quickly. And so, for example, we set a new state of the art for this ImageNet 1% semi-supervised evaluation task. This is where we do pre-training. And then for the downstream task, we receive only 1% of ImageNet with, with, with labels. And so that corresponds to having about 10 to 12 labeled examples per class. Um, and you can see kind of the numbers here. It's, it's showing the top one accuracy for this I, IJEPA, Image Joint Embedding Predictive Architecture Approach. 
uh, compared to some of the other methods from the literature. Great. So if you want to learn more about this, then uh, I invite you to come stop by the poster, which is going to be presented at the main conference on Wednesday, um, Wednesday evening, or I guess afternoon. Yes. And uh, let me conclude or begin to conclude. So I hope the main message that you take away from the talk today is that pre-training can help it alleviate the effects of heterogeneity and federated learning. I think there's still a lot more that we need to study to understand this phenomenon better, but I really do believe that there's something there. Uh, and as a recommendation to the community going forward, I'd like to suggest that when, when we're thinking about evaluating different methods, we shouldn't just evaluate them starting from randomized initializations, but we should also think about how they might behave if you're starting from some sort of a pre-trained initialization, because these seem to have qualitatively different uh, behaviors for quite a few different algorithms. And in practice, we might be able to start not always, but in many applications, we might be able to start from a pre-trained initialization. Thinking about uh, future work, there for sure we I think we need to have some theory to better quantify the effects of initialization and pre-training in federated learning and maybe also in, in general. Um, of course, there's issues that we'll need to also better get a better handle on things like how does the data set that you do your pre-training on potentially introduce biases or more generally, how do we handle distribution shift between the data set that we're pre-training on and then what we were doing federated training on afterwards. And like I hinted at at the end of the talk there, there's other forms of pre-training besides supervised pre-training that seem very uh, both interesting and important to study further, things like meta-learning and self-supervised learning. Um, and I'm gonna wrap up early, but hopefully there's maybe a couple of questions and then we can also enjoy lunch. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi, thank you so much for that great talk. Uh, I just was wondering about the speed up that you may have ob observed regarding basically pre-training the models. What kind of uh, epochs uh, did you save in terms of uh, server time or like training time? Jen? So we didn't try to quantify it specifically for this study. Um, I think you could go about doing this kind of a study in one of two ways. One is you fix the number of rounds that you're going to do for federated training for all algorithms, and you see what is the final accuracy that you get to. The other approach, which we didn't do, but which could be done, would be to fix a target accuracy and see how long it takes each method to get there from different initializations. So, and that would help, help to quantify yeah. this, this speed up. So part of this study, what was the cutoff mechanism? Which cutoff? Basically for the training, lost, stopped going, and you just stopped. Uh, wh what was the stopping? Yeah. So we fixed the number of rounds. So we said ah. every algorithm gets to run for, I forget, it changed for each workload, but say a thousand rounds. Um, and we see who gets to the best accuracy at the end of the thousand rounds. Fair enough. Thank you I so think much. I can have backup slides. Um, yeah, so this would be, these are, I wouldn't read too much from this, but this is the kind of thing that you see if you look at some of the training, um, training curves. Right now, keep in mind that, you know, so I, I, I hesitate to draw too many conclusions from these because the learning algorithm, the learning rates here were tuned to get the best final accuracy for each method, mm -hmm. not to get to a target accuracy as quickly as possible. So that might change things. But you see, for example, with CIFAR, um, at initialization, the accuracies are not too different between pre-trained, which is in blue, and random, which is in orange. Um, but, you know, it learns much quicker. Again, this is without quantifying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. I think this question refers to the slide which you just showed. Yep. Yep. Um, so you never talk, you always talked about the final accuracy, but what is the collaboration gain? Right? So if you start with a pre-trained model and just use, use local data, you have a standalone accuracy. Compared to that, how much improvement do you get through the federation process? Right. Okay. So this is a good question. What if you were to just have the pre-trained features and only train locally on device? Is that what you're asking? Yes. So I don't remember if we looked at that specifically in the paper. I think for most of, yeah. So I don't have a concrete answer for that one. Um, other than to say, I believe that there is a gain. What we did look at in the paper, in the appendix, is what were what if you were to freeze the backbone and only train the classification head? in a federated manner. And you definitely see a, a you know, non-trivial gap between doing that and training the entire model end-to-end -end in a federated way, even from the pre-trained initialization. 
So my hunch is that I think, and I think some of these problems are even set up so that the question might be ill-posed if you don't do federated training in the sense that any individual client does not have instances of all classes. And so you have to think carefully about how to evaluate in that setting as well. But it, it's a good question. It is a good question. So, so I guess in that sense, you have the free training model, then you just train the locally. That's kind of like centralized transfer learning. Yeah. So that definitely, you know, if the data distribution, I mean, is similar, or we all using ImageNet pre trained model to the fine tune. So in general, I think it will improve performance locally. Yeah. Um, I do have a question. Okay. So, so I think this is a, a very uh, insightful work. We actually look at your paper and also um, I think one other group from Ohio State, they also analyze uh, the pre-train model and uh, train from scratch. So it gets maybe similar uh, conclusion. So I was also wondering um, if, if you explore the, uh, here you're using the supervised pre-train model, right? So what about the self-supervised, like a Dino V2, Dino, series like what's the difference or which one we should you know choose you know in practice yeah so i think that's a great question sort of i don't have conclusions to share with you today um but i think it's definitely a question worth asking yeah yeah, okay. yeah. oh hello may i ask a question online please go ahead yeah sure go ahead yeah, I see your future work mentioned uh, self-supervised learning for the pre-training. Can you elaborate a little bit how the self-supervised can, can be done uh, with the pre-training? Sure. So I'm thinking in this case of doing self-supervised pre-training in, uh, in, you know, offline, not, not in the federated phase. Um, there's several methods that have been proposed in the literature for how to do this. The iJEPA one is a recent one that I just mentioned, but there's several predecessors before that. Um, so it depends on, you know, kind of the, the modality of data that you want to deal with, whether it's images, text, images and text, and so on. Um, I guess if you have specifics in mind, I'm happy to follow up offline, um, and with suggestions for what, what you could consider there. But I think there's already a, you know, kind of substantial and growing literature around various ways to do self-supervised pre-training. I don't know if that oh, helps. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you again. Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, you have a question? <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. All right, so um, yeah, thank you all for coming to the morning session. So we're gonna start the afternoon session at 1.30. Yeah, okay, thank you. Going up so far? Going up so far? Is Dr. Shaw here? Dr. Shaw is here, right? Okay. We're not doing the CV, CRCV launch anymore? Yes. Wednesday? Okay. Okay. Problem is. I know. Uh, <laughs> Wednesday. Yeah. 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 Yeah.